I'd like to call to order the December 17, 2019 meeting of the Boulder City Council. Um, as usual, um, we've closed signups for open comment. Um, and as also usual, um, during open comment, you can speak to us about anything that's on your mind except for one of our public hearings that will come later in the evening. So our public hearings tonight are the acquisition of Shanahan Ranch by OSMB, um, a commitment, a resolution committing the council to racial equity work, um, a landmark designation of 2326 Goss Street, and then an updated transportation design standards first phase. So with all that said. Thank you, I'll take roll. <laughs> council member Brockett. Present. Friend. Here. Joseph. Present. Nagel. Here. Swetlick. Here. Wallach. Here. Weaver. Here. Yates. Here. Young. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. <clears throat> I was supposed to do that earlier, but I'll get better at this. Um, I would like to propose that we add one item to the agenda this evening, which is hearing um, from Representative Joe Neguse. He's taped a message for us, and Jill Grano will be presenting that. So moved. Second. All in favor? Okay, very good. And with that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I just want to pass on congratulations to all the new members from Congressman Neguse. He's thrilled about all of you. And hello to all the rest of you, all my former colleagues. It's great to see you. And we just want to say happy holidays and thank you so much for your work. And Congressman Neguse wishes he could have been here tonight, but he's in D.C. and uh, filmed a little video for you guys to give a quick update. Hello there, uh, it's your Congressman, Joe Neguse, and I apologize that I couldn't be with you tonight in person. I wanted to say thank you for stepping up to serve our community, and I look forward to partnering with you as we continue to work to make our communities healthier, safer, and a better place to live. I wanted to give you an update from my office. It's been a busy year. This year, we've been proud to introduce 22 pieces of legislation, the most of any freshman lawmaker in the country, and all of which came directly from our local leaders across the second district, including many of you. Working directly with our city council members, our county commissioners, our local housing authorities, and higher education institutions, we've been able to propose some significant legislation that will tangibly and directly impact our communities for the better. We continue to want to hear from you so we can be the best partner at the federal level in government. And I hope you'll reach out to Jill Grano, our Director of Community Affairs, to that end. Together, we've passed the Colorado Outdoor Recreation and Economy Act out of the United States House of Representatives, which was the first major Colorado wilderness legislation to pass the House in the last decade. Uh, the legislation was crafted by Coloradans over the last decade and represents the collaboration of communities across our state, including in Summit and Eagle counties, in order to preserve 400,000 acres of public lands. I was honored uh, to lead this legislation in the House written by our communities to protect the lands we love and designate the first ever National Historic Landscape at Camp Hale. Through partnership with our local communities, we've introduced legislation to expand affordable housing opportunities and lower the cost of higher education through open education resources and making the transfer process easier. We've also introduced legislation to lower the cost of health care, ensure helicopter safety, and combat the climate crisis through investments in solar energy and regenerative agriculture. We're also working to install the first ever outdoor monument to honor the women's suffrage movement in Washington, D.C. Uh, the monument is crafted uh, by an incredible sculptor in Loveland, Colorado, a beautiful part of our congressional district. We also were able to highlight Colorado by hosting the first and only field hearing from the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis just a few months ago, uh, right here in our district. And I'm so grateful to the many municipal and uh, governmental partners uh, that made that happen. We've advocated for increased federal funding for our federal labs, our National Park Service, and the National Science Foundation, as well as full funding for the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act, something that so many school board members across our district have made clear to me as a top priority. I'm cr incredibly grateful for the input of our communities and the input of our council members over the last year to help me represent <coughs> our communities well. 
Our office uh, is equipped to connect our cities and towns to federal agencies and to write letters of support for grants. Uh, we've already been successful in a few large grants for towns across the district, including a grant for Grand County's lift system and Breckenridge's energy efficient buses. And we hope that you'll utilize us in future requests in this regard. We're ready to hear from you on policy proposals that will help our neighbors and hopeful we will continue to find ways to partner together in the new year. I also just want to say that your work is incredibly important and I am so grateful for each and every one of you as public servants. It is such a joy to serve with you and I look forward to working with you in all the year to come. Thank you again for your service to Colorado. Thank you, Council, and I just want to echo what Congressman Magoo said, that everything that we've brought to the House of Representatives this year has come directly from the district. We worked, in fact, with Boulder's Housing Authority, um, who, who let us know about a, a loophole where you can sort of get out of affordable housing after 15 years when it's meant to be preserved for 30, and so we brought forward a bill into the House um, to, to close that loophole. Uh, Mayor Weaver has worked with us on many of our environmental bills, so please, as 2020 approaches and as we have a, a new Council, think of our office if there's anything that you want to see happen at the federal level or if there's anything that we can do to support the community. We love you guys. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jill, for being here. And um, thanks to Congressman Nagoose for the kind words and all his hard work. Thank you. Yes, and this week especially with the solemn work that's going on in Washington right now. Yes, indeed. Okay, and with that, I think we'll begin open comment. How many people do we have signed up, Lynette? We have 12 people. 12? And so I believe with 12 people, do we do three minutes usually? It's always two at open comment. Okay. James Feeney, followed by Leslie Glustrom and Elizabeth Black. I'm James Feeney from North Boulder. Two weeks ago, I came before this council to ask you to explain to me why the city's dark sky ordinance is still not being enforced for residential outdoor lighting in my neighborhood. At that time, city council remained silent and chose not to respond. However, city council might choose to respond tonight. We can at least set the public record. So I ask again, please explain to me why the city's dark sky ordinance is still not being enforced for residential outdoor lighting in my neighborhood. Trying to make sense of all this, I have to wonder about the city's form of government. And to put this in perspective, suppose that we were discussing a national government. Suppose that we had a national government in which every legislative deliberation was mediated by the chief executive, where in fact every piece of legislation was written by the chief executive, and where the legislature never even wrote its own bills. And then suppose that the chief executive was not even an elected officer. More than that, suppose that this unelected chief executive was chief executive for life. And for nuance, suppose that this unelected chief executor for life was ever shadowed by an unelected chief prosecutor for life who never chose to prosecute the police no matter what the actions these police might take against the people or might fail to take in support of the people. Where do we see these unelected rulers for life and their pol police? How do we feel about national governments like this? Looking around at world governments, we might agree that this form of government was intolerable and it embodied the very definition of a corrupt dictatorship. And then why do we consider that this is an acceptable form of government in the city of Boulder? And why do we presume that we will get some different result? City councils will come and go, but the chief executive and chief prosecutors stay on and on. And while our older city council members might support this unelected ruler for life form of government, I look to our younger council members for hope and the possibility of reform. Thank you, James. Leslie, then Elizabeth Black, followed by Patrick Murphy. Good evening, Council. Leslie Glustrom. Uh, I live in Boulder and uh, really appreciate this opportunity. Wish you all a great holiday. Hope you get a bit of rest. So as many of you know, I come down just to thank you for caring about climate change. I know you all do, but you get to have so many things on your agenda. So I just really am here because I believe it's the divining issue of our times. This is just the most recent 
story from Hawaii, what's going on over in Hawaii and the coral reefs. Uh, when we look at our con contribution to it, about half of our greenhouse gas emissions come from electricity, so I focus a lot on electricity because I am passionate about this defining issue of our times. Um, many of you know that XL is making progress, but they're still way over 50% fossil fuels. 2018, it was 73%. That'll come down some in 2019, which I'm excited about, but they'll still be well, 60 odd, something we'll find out in another month or two. My slides all have the, the source of the information at the bottom. Um, and many of you know that I'm here to kind of provide some context for the discussions about municipalization. We to refer to this as little blue bars and big red bars. The little blue bars are the amount of money we've spent since 2018 on the municipalization effort. The big red bars are the revenue very conservatively estimated that go out of our community every year to Excel. So I've brought a little coin. I just, as we go forward, as we get closer to what we call the go, no go, vote. I think it's going to be very important to look at both sides of the coin. It's pretty easy to find the data because actually the city is relatively transparent, certainly compared to XL, the data about the little blue bars. It's very difficult to find the data about the big red bars. Many of you know I've spent 15 years drilling down into the data on the big red bars. So this is a series of rate increases that XL has gotten in Colorado, and we, you can see it's over a half billion dollars a year. We're going to have another one to put up the next time I see you. So Again, doing it in two-minute segments is hard, but I'll be back. So thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie. Um, <clears throat> Elizabeth Black, followed by Patrick Murphy and Sammy Lawrence. Elizabeth Black, 4340 North 13th Street. Last month I described the Citizen Science Soil Health Project where 40 growers collected 96 soil samples. Today I'll tell you about our preliminary findings. First, there's a huge range of soil health scores across Boulder County, from a low of three to a high of 36. Scores over 18 are rare in Colorado, so we should be quite proud of our high scores. This hopeful graph shows what's possible in our area. We can get good soil health scores and sequester more carbon here. There's lots of upside potential for some of our lower scoring fields. How about organic versus conventional growing methods? How many folks here believe that organic growers have better soil health than conventional growers? Well, that is not what we found. I divided our 96 sites into three groups, organic, conventional, and non-farm. Organic sites, the yellow bars on the graph, use only organically certified compost manure, fertilizer, and pesticides. Conventional sites, the red bars, use all kinds of compost manure, fertilizer, and pesticides. Non-farm sites, the green bars, are what are where no crop is grown, like uncultivated, abandoned ag fields, forests, or grasslands. You can see that the graph has no real clear pattern. It's sort of a mishmash. But when I look at median scores, there's a surprise. Our organic and conventional growers have the same median soil health score of 13.6. So organic methods are not any better than conventional methods in terms of soil health. However, the non-farm group beat them both with a median score of 21. Stay tuned for our next exciting installment of Soil Health 101 to find out why the non-farm group is doing so much better. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Patrick Murphy and Sammy Lawrence, followed by Lynn Siegel. You skipped a slide. Did I back up? <coughs> there we go. My name is Patrick Murphy. I live in Boulder. It's 2019, but 2020 is about to begin for the Muni and hopefully end it. Muni losses increase by one more year and millions of dollars. Here are the 24 articles of the Muni Naughty List. These 24 items are called articles in honor of impeachment week. 
Muni Naughty List, Article 1. <coughs> Separation costs that were originally estimated to be $10 million are now around $110 million. This is the definition of a one order of magnitude estimation error. 10 times underestimated, a 1,000% error. The reasons for this will be presented as parts of Article 10 and Article 17. Article 2, the Muni schedule was supposed to be completed in 2017, but will extend to 2024, just to begin, and may extend to 2029, just to pay stranded cost, while Excel will be at 80% renewables by 2030. Instead of a Muni that was up and running after seven years, it'll take at least 14 years. This is an underestimate with a doubling of the time we were promised, a 100% error. Article 3, rejecting the 2016 conversion of all streetlights to LEDs for reasons including slightly increased acquisition costs when all the towns around us have already accepted them. LED streetlights would save us money and reduce carbon. We're three years behind our neighbors. We're not leaders. We're losers. This begins the articles of the Muni Naughty List. Only 21 articles to go. Articles 4 through 24 will follow. The planet burns, floods, and dies while Boulder fiddles. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, next we have Sammy Lawrence, Lynn Siegel, followed by Corey Hogg. <clears throat> <sighs> Testing one, two, perfect. Greetings, new city council members and new city council. I wanted to first start off by saying congratulations. As some of you know or may not know, my name is Sammy Leon Lawrence IV, not the first, second, nor third. And I would like to also take a moment of time to provide an interesting story of humility. Um, when I was five years old, I had made a racist comment in front of my mother. And it's very weird for me to specifically say this in front of you, Mary Young, as a person who is of Asian descent. Um, when I was younger, I had made the mistake of speaking to Asian drivers not driving fast enough. I had heard this before and passed from my stepmother. And one of the most interesting things about me saying this specifically is that after echoing it to my mother, she chastised me immediately commented on how I was wrong and why I was wrong, and took time to not only address the wrongs of what I said, but likewise as well, to speed a little faster to show that I was actually very wrong. This moment when I was six years old impacted me to where I eventually went to a Myanmar internment camp in Reno to watch the results of how we treated Japanese and Asian Americans in this city, in this state, or in this country, rather, my bad. And I share this with you because this moment of humility impacted me to being a part of who I am now. And I would hope and pray that we as a community are able to remember times when we were young and wrong and were able to grow and learn, especially when we were willing to be able to learn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sammy. Thanks for that. I'm Mexican-American. My apologies. My apologies for that. And see, that is racism. And if I can say one more before the time frame, there are some times when we can make wrong mistakes and have the good intention behind it. Owning that accountability when you're wrong and apologizing and moving forward is important. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you. Um, Lynn Siegel, Corey Hogg, and Evan Ravitz. I went, uh, Lynn Siegel, 538 Dewey. I went on the um, affordable housing tour. Um, and up at the b bus stop, it used to be the strip club. It's now a housing area. And Michael Bosma, who's doing 311, actually um, was working with another guy in that project. Um, they have solar, but they have electric stoves. And when I say electric, I mean not magnetic induction. Um, so it looks good. It's kind of greenwash, though. And I found another um, 
place on the tour. It was very much of a rush deal, so you didn't really get to see uh, a lot of the detail that you would need to about the energy efficiency of the place. But if you're talking about diversity and inclusion and all, um, and make it actually uh, the bus stop includes your electricity bill and your rent, which is kind of interesting because if you're comparing apples and oranges, you know, to places that are that are not covering your utilities, it gets confusing. But um, those are things to think about when um, when we're trying to elevate minorities and um, and people with lower incomes in how in affordable housing. Um, in in uh, Hong Kong, this is um, where you live, 60 square feet, three bunk beds, six by 10 foot room. It probably has a high ceiling to get three bunk beds on it, but um, there's your beds, your kitchen, <laughs> your, you know, like a cooktop thing, and um, like a di dining table, storage is up high, and God forbid how many people live there. Um, I just think that we could um, kind of come somewhere in between in Boulder. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Corey Hogg, Evan Rabbits, and Stephen Keenan, please. Before my time begins, can I offer, um, or not offer, can I ask a couple of questions on process? No, why don't you just launch into it? That'd be just great. Just launch into mm -hmm. it, okay. So I find that it is extremely detrimental to have a two minute time frame on these because a lot of times uh, information can't be processed in two minutes and information can't even be conveyed in two minutes for almost any subject whatsoever, let alone offering the character behind it. So um, I would ask that this be reviewed by the council to determine a better time frame that allows people the time to actually offer what they're saying and then allow that to be absorbed. Um, I have six pages of information that's being passed around and because I don't have time to go over any amount of it, I'll just skip ahead to the, the, the 5G stuff that's um, somewhere in back pages. Um, it is my understanding that this council um, determined to undertake studies to learn what the real effects of 5G are. Um, so 5G isn't all that much different than 4G. Saying that we need to undergo more studies to determine the effects of 5G um, doesn't really mean anything. There's actually um, 30 years, 6,000 studies, peer-reviewed studies, not corporate-funded studies that say that 4G and microwaves and cell phones, because it all runs on the microwave, um, extremely low frequency band, that chronically they cause 90% of the disease that we see today is what the, the um, uh, 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 CDC says. 90% of all disease, CDC says, comes from microwave radiation in the form that's produced through um, Wi-Fi, baby monitors, um, everything, cell phone towers. So um, I don't have any time to actually go into this, but we don't need to have more studies. All we need to do is review the thousands of studies that already exist saying that it causes cancer. And I know that this council doesn't actually have the authority to say no 5G in the future, but um, taking a stand to say that the city is not going to implement 5G is actually taking a stand for the lives of the people that are here saying that we're not going to allow our, our people to have Thank cancer. Thank you, Corey. Um, now we have Evan Rabbit, Stephen Keenan, and Ali Catherine Wild. Evan Ravitz, North Boulder. <clears throat> I agree with what, what Corey said about the two minute time limit. I've seen many lawyers struggle to make their point in that time here. One of my favorite sayings is attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt. Great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, small minds discuss people. This is a main reason I've been promoting direct democracy for 30 years. I want a politics of ideas, not a cult of personalities. But what has preoccupied this chamber and our local media for a month now? Council member Mirabai Nagel's mistake, understandable for a young woman who grew up in Lily White Boulder. The fact that we swim in white privilege can be invisible, like water to a fish. 
Meanwhile, not a peep from any of the media except KGNU about Boulder's world's first online petition for direct democracy, which was approved by voters 71 to 29 percent in 2018, and which has been obstructed and delayed by city staff who tried to keep it off the ballot, tried to substitute an inferior system Denver has, and who rejected a free system, just what we wanted from a national nonprofit in favor of an absurdly overkill system which will cost over $200,000. This is the same city staff that went behind council's back to get the opp Opportunity Zone, which is free money for rich people to gentrify Boulder. Now they go behind council's back to waste over $200,000 of our tax money, and after 13 months, not one line of software has been written. I want to be able to propose and vote on laws without the brain damage of running for council or begging here for mercy for decades. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Stephen Keenan, Allie Catherine Wild, and then Rob Smoke. <clears throat> Good evening, council. Congratulations on the new council members. Um, I think that uh, if the uh, vote for the, if the people are going to be voting in 2021 about extending the uh, acquisition of the Excel assets, um, I think it might be good for the city to encourage a group called the Breakthrough Energy Movement to have their meeting in 2021 here in Boulder. They started off in Amsterdam in 2012. They had a meeting in Boulder. We had an event here in Boulder in 2013. Took a few years off, had a meeting in Texas. Just had our fourth meeting in, back in Amsterdam a few weeks ago. Uh, it's global, so it's the breakthrough energy movement. And I'm talking about cold fusion. And I, I think that we should stretch the limits with our discussions with um, Excel because this new technology that we have, you know, this is a DARPA invented technology. And just as they invented the internet in what, 1969 is when ARPANET was um, invented with the Defense Advanced Research Project. We didn't see the internet until decades later. We've demonstrated this new technology. And bringing it into the marketplace, you're talking about disrupting a lot of people. Oil and gas and coal will go obsolete. Boulder has an obligation that if we think that we're going to be in the forefront of renewables, we have to look into this breakthrough energy movement group, please. And invite them to have their next meeting here around the time of the vote. So it's global, B-E-M, all one word, global, Breakthrough Energy Movement, globalbem.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Next we have Allie Catherine Wild, then Rob Smoke and Sandra Jones. Howdy, I'm glad to see everyone again, and I'm pleased to be part of the group who gets to address the city council. Um, first, uh, thank you. So I've been afraid because of my housing. I have BHP housing. I live at Third and Pearl. And I'm sorry, but Every time I come here, I have this angst and anger that I wish to express, but, you know, of course, it's joy that carries the day. So, um, I live at Third and Pearl. The thing that I want to bring attention to is how Boulder Housing Partners handles compliance. Now, Boulder Housing um, is under more rules than HUD, but HUD dominates the place where I live. And um, so I learned a lot about the rules last year because we had a meth house in our neighborhood, and ultimately the resident was evicted without representation and with pressure from BHP. So, you know, I thought that was difficult. So here's what Boulder Housing Partners uses as evidence for eviction. They use police reports, but we know that police reports don't prove anything. They can be good, depending on the uh, talent and precision of the police officer, but they don't prove anything, and those are the things that are used to evict people. Another thing they use, which is something that I have difficulty is, with, is something called a demand for compliance or possession letter, and those are written by Boulder Housing Partners um, employees. And as a resident, if a false claim is made, a resident may not address 
older housing partners, and so there's a lack of transparency. But those letters of demand for compliance can then be used for eviction, and I find that, that to be very difficult. So my question is, who looks at Boulder Housing Partners compliance failures? Who looks at the impact of the system systemic generated compliance failures? Who made it possible to use police reports as a means of eviction when police reports do not prove a crime? Who is gathering data on the integrity of BHP? Thank you. Thank you. Rob Smoke and then Sandra Jones. Good evening, my name is Rob Smoke. Congrats to, uh, I live in Boulder, congrats to everybody who just uh, got elected. Um, I ran for city council twice in <coughs> 2005, 2007, and my, my cat was my campaign manager in 2007, <laughs> and uh, I had people coming up to me in Whole Foods, like multiple people saying, can I just vote for your cat? Do I have to vote for you? <laughs> anyway, I, uh, you know, uh, any, uh, I'm not going to comment on the racial equity uh, issue, but in terms of social equity, um, I have to give our previous prior councils a big fail. Uh, you talk about opportunity zones. Well, all you have to do is do uh, Google search opportunity zone problems, and you'll find the articles from City Lab and other places where they've done very careful analysis, and it's, a, it's about giving away tax money, which is supposed to, you know, supposed to help all of us to wealthy uh, developers. So it's dead wrong to do that, and it's a horrible uh, score for social equity when you approve uh, opportunity zones. Uh, in terms of policing, I recently read uh, something, I think it was on Next Door Table Mesa, there was a, a community policing uh, dialogue event. And in that uh, pitch for that event, uh, the police wrote, if you have a complaint about accountability or something like that, uh, there's a there's a specific office to call, you know, um, the um, what do you call it? The uh, the review board that the the, uh, the police department has right now. And uh, so, in other words, you're going to have a, a discussion of community policing without accountability, you know, uh, rearing its head at that that discussion group. Um, in terms of uh, dealing with uh, homeless issues, uh, all you have to do is uh, look up Boise decision and, and realize that, yeah, uh, we accept uh, using uh, the jail as de facto housing under certain, under certain circumstances, and it's very destructive to do that. Thank so you, Rob. I just want to say big fail and a lot of work that this council has to do to make amends on a lot of these issues. Thank you. Yeah. Sandra Jones. Good evening, council members. I'm here from the Butterfly Foundation. Uh, you probably haven't heard of it. We're a teensy tiny small profit that not small nonprofit that serves the whole state of Colorado. And essentially, what our goal is is to assist people who've um, experienced a tragedy, an unexpected illness, death, etc., and provide them with the means and support to be able to overcome that tragedy. Um, I have a wonderful problem. I do have a pool of money from our private donors and we have had a tough time getting really great nominations. Our website is www.coloradobutterfly.org. Anybody can nominate. We make the process really simple. I'll interview them and um, we can provide that support very quickly. Um, I left card business cards uh, with your uh, council staff and thank you for your time. Thank you. And with that, we will close open comment and turn to staff to see if you have any responses to issues that were raised. So just a clarification that, <coughs> excuse me, the prior council did not approve um, the opportunity zone. Indeed, um, I authorized the staff to apply for it and w among many other parts of the state of Colorado. The former governor um, nominated us and it was approved by the federal government and we can't get out of it. What the former council did is um, enact zoning regulations that w would limit the negative impacts of it. So I just want to be clear that the council did not approve the opportunity zone. 
Um, secondly, Joan Goose's introduction inspired me to remind all of you something that perhaps you do not know, that 2020 is the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And the state of Colorado was the last state in 1919 to adopt the 19th Amendment. And it occurred on December 15th, so it's almost 100 years and two days ago that our state approved the 19th Amendment women's suffrage in Colorado. I thought you might be interested in that. Um, thank you. I have nothing. Okay. Um, anyone else on council have any responses to issues we heard about at open comment? So I have a few questions for staff that came from it. Um, <clears throat> this is just to clarify, as far as the energy efficiency codes that affordable housing projects are built to, they're built to the same codes and standards as the rest of our building stock, right? Oh, yes. Okay, yes. just to clarify. Um, then on LEDs, I, I just thought staff has done a really nice reply to Mr. Murphy, and so it's well worth reading. I don't know if you want to put that out to other folks to look at. It's a very clear explanation of the process and the reason that we were waiting until the color temperature right. came down. So I just wanted to compliment um, Caroline Lum for that and to say that that's well worth wider distribution, I think. Um, two more quick things. I sat down with a T-Mobile person, and we have somebody who brought up 5G here. And what I learned about 5G is that telecom companies are kind of making it up as they go. So the T-Mobile band is the 600 megahertz band, which is about 10 times below where um, 4G typically operates. And they want that for rural areas. And then the stuff that we've heard more about is stuff that's about 10 to 15 times higher bandwidth. So I would just put out there, on the subject of 5G, just because a, a mobile company calls it that doesn't necessarily mean it's moved closer to ionizing radiation. So just an FYI, that was news to me. And then I guess I have a final comment on Boulder Housing Partners. Bob, I would turn to you as our representative on the BHP board and ask, is there a chance for the public to address the board either in writing or in person? Yes, um, at every BHP board meeting, which is which occurs once a month, there is an opportunity for the public to speak to um, the board, and Ali Catherine has spoken to the board um, pretty consistently, I think, this year, uh, almost every meeting. And I know that the staff has followed up with Ali Catherine on some of the issues that she's raised. Okay. Very good. That's all I had for open comment. Okay, the next thing is your consent agenda. You have items A through J before you tonight. And I wanted to bring up the possibility <coughs> of, at CAC, it had been mentioned that some council members may want to ask questions or bring up the food tax issue here. I don't know if we want to do it now or save it until later. Mary? Well, since it's been um, coming up, I just wanted to well, I posted something on the hotline earlier today asking some questions. And just to summarize my conclusion from the answers to my questions is that um, what gets refunded is about less than a tenth of the total um, revenue from the food tax. Um, no, actually, it isn't. It's way less than that. Um, the, the people that are eligible, if everybody that was eligible um, submitted a, re a request for a refund, it would be a, a little less than a tenth of the revenue. And um, I asked questions about the outreach and what's changing, and, um, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity there for improving the outreach and, um, and reaching more people with um, applications for the refund. Um, and given that um, we have committed in some way that revenue um, through 2038, um, my suggestion would be to consider this as part of the budget strategy project. Mm -hmm. Okay, Aaron. Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, then and as part of that budget strategy process, in addition to outreach, we might consider uh, broadening the criteria of people who are eligible. 
So it's just something that we can talk about when we get there. Rachel? I would do the same, and I'm still confused as to, like if I am a CU student who's 19 uh, and does not have a disability and live here nine months of the year, I can't qualify, right? It requires a full year and you have to be, either, if you're over 18, you need to be, I think, a head of a family-ish. So, <laughs> so <laughs> just like us to look at that as well. We have some people in the audience that can answer that question. So this is Eden, thank you. I'm Eden Bailey, I work for Housing and Human Services and my team administers this program. So yes, the way the ordinance is written now, um, in order to qualify, you have to be an adult, which is 18, with a disability, or you have to be an adult 62 and over, or a family with children 18 and under 18 that are living with you for the entire year. So those have been, um, the way the ordinance was written, those were considered vulnerable populations, so that's the age requirement. The eligibility requirement, aside from having been a resident for the entire previous calendar year, is at 50% or below of the area median income that's set by HUD. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Nope, doesn't look like it. Okay, um, anything else on the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. Second. Show of hands, right? Um, no. Roll call. Roll call vote. Um, we begin with Council Member Wallach. Mayor Weaver? Aye. Council Member Yates? Aye. Young? Yes. Brockett? Aye. Friend? Yes. Joseph? Aye. Nagel? Aye. Swetlick? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. You have two call-up check-ins before you this evening. The first is a site and use review for 1852 Arapahoe Avenue. Does anybody want to call that one up? Your second one is a concept plan review for 2400 and 2450 Central Avenue. Anyone want to call that up? Nope, I think we're good. Your first public hearing is the Shanahan Ranch purchase. Good evening, my name's Luke McKay, I'm a property agent with Open Space and Mountain Parks. And for tonight's presentation on the Shanahan Ranch acquisition, I'm gonna break it down into um, two parts. I'll begin by talking about what we're trying to acquire, which will include a brief overview of the property and uh, history of Sh Shanahan Ranch, followed by a discussion of why we're recommending that we acquire it. I'll then wrap up uh, providing some of the details of the purchase and staff's recommended motion. So Shanahan Ranch is approximately 179 acres located at 1019 South Foothills Highway. It's bordered by the Devil's Thumb and Shanahan Ridge neighborhoods to the north and west, State Highway 93 to the east, and OSMP fee and conservation easement lands to the south. The property includes one and one quarter shares in South Boulder and Bear Creek Ditch, one of the most senior and therefore high yielding and valuable water rights on South Boulder Creek, as well as three ponds. The property also has a severed mineral estate. So generally speaking, the minerals under the east half of the property are owned by the Colorado State Land Board, while the minerals under the west half of the property are owned by the city and the Shanahan family. And I'll pr provide a little more detail on that in a little bit. And lastly, the property includes a ranch headquarters consisting of a single family home and five agricultural outbuildings. And the ranch headquarters is on the map in front of you is outlined by that purple rectangle. So Shanahan Ranch was homesteaded in 1863 by the owner's great-grandfather, becoming a fixture in the community that has grown around it. 
1967, it was identified as a priority for preservation in the city's first ever acquisition plan and has remained a priority <coughs> of the city ever since. In 1985, as part of a larger effort to prevent the development of a golf course and housing complex on Shanahan Ranch and what is now the Dover Blacker and Boulder Greens Venture open space properties, the city acquired two development rights agreements from the Shanahan family, which extinguished nine of the 11 development rights associated with the property. At that time, the city also acquired from the family one and a half shares in South Boulder and Bear Creek Ditch and their mineral rights, except for their oil and gas interests. And so although the purchase of the development rights agreements helped to prevent the development of the golf course and housing complex, they do not fully protect the property from development, nor do they fully preserve the property's open space charter purposes that would be codified by the city a year later in 1986. And so since 1985, the fee acquisition of the property has remained a high priority for the city. In 2008, we almost acquired the property and were under contract to do so, but had to back out of the purchase due to the rising global financial crisis and uncertainty over OSMP's acquisition funding. Since 2008, the property has been listed for sale several times and we've been in on and off negotiations with, with the Shanahan family. And so considering that history, it's staff's opinion that this is the city's final opportunity to acquire and preserve this property. It's often said that the opportunities to acquire and protect land that have been owned by the same family for generations are often once in a generation. And based on our experience, it's rare to get a second opportunity with the same generation. So that's some background on Shanahan Ranch and what, what we're trying to acquire. And I'll spend the rest of my time speaking about why we're recommending that the city acquire it and why it has remained such a high priority for all these years. So the primary reason that this acquisition is a high priority is it will enable us to preserve, steward, and manage a comprehensive array of charter purposes and resources, not only on Shanahan Ranch, but given its size, location, and the interconnectedness of those purposes and resources, we will be able to better preserve, better steward, and better manage charter purposes and resources on surrounding open space as well. So for example, the property supports native tall grass prairie, that, prairie that's considered imperiled on global and state levels by the Colorado Natural Heritage Program. These grasslands are classified as having very high biodiversity significance and provide important habitat for ground nesting songbirds, rare butterflies, and winter habitat for mule deer. However, this acquisition will not only protect the tall grass prairie on Shanahan Ranch, but better enable staff to steward and manage these grasslands on a landscape scale. And so the map in front of you shows the Colorado tall grass prairie state natural area, including its current boundaries and proposed additions. Based on feedback from the Colorado Natural Heritage Program, Shanahan Ranch is a likely addition to the state natural area, and given its, given its size, location, and infrastructure, it will provide important buffer to these critical grasslands create an opportunity to expand these once extensive plant communities and provide a hub for the agricultural management of this area. Similarly, the ranch's irrigated lower elevation grasslands and ponds provide potential opportunities to manage for important species like northern leopard frogs, which were observed on one of the property's ponds and bobolinks as part of the de department's larger management efforts for protecting these species. This acquisition will also permanently preserve a property that's commonly referred to as the gateway to the city and help the city protect the viewshed and scenic areas not only west of State Highway 93, but also from our extensive network of trails and nearby open space in this area. The property is one of Boulder County's oldest ranches and is irrigated with one of the most senior water rights on S South Boulder Creek with an appropriation date of 1862. But what makes this property especially unique is its size, location, and existing infrastructure, including a residence that the department's agricultural resource staff envisions serving as a headquarters for a future agricultural operation. Having a headquarters in this area is key for not only better ensuring continued agricultural use on the property in the future, but also continued agricultural use on surrounding open space, which includes lands in the Tallgrass Prairie State Natural Area. <coughs> So we also wanna highlight that since Shanahan Ranch has been privately owned and the development rights agreements did not grant to the city rights to provide public access, there are no planned trails, trail connections, or access points for this property. However, the property is within the West Trail Study Area, and given the proximity to existing trails and trailheads, 
and recommendations outlined in the department's visitor master plan and the West TSA, there is the potential to offer passive recreational opportunities on this property in the future. And the property will also be a evaluated for interpretive, educational, and service learning programs and events in the outcomes and strategies of the community connections, education, and inclusion focus area and OSMP's recent master plan. And so speaking of the master plan, how the department will protect, steward, and manage the property's charter purposes and resources will be guided by the master plan, as well as OSMP's resource management plans, including the agricultural resources management plan and the grassland ecosystem management plan. So those are the primary charter purposes and resources we're protecting and the OSMP plans that we're advancing, accelerating with this acquisition. And, and one question we've gotten a lot over the years is, you know, don't the development rights agreements already protect those purposes and resources and accomplish the city's stewardship and management goals for not only this property, but the surrounding area? And, and the answer to that is, you know, in staff's opinion is no, they do not. And here are five reasons why. First, the property can be subdivided into as many as three parcels, which would not only impact the viability of future agricultural operations, but also fragment the property's unique flora and fauna, fra fragile ecosystems, and wildlife habitats. Secondly, the agreements allow for the development of a currently undeveloped residential site and the redevelopment or re and or relocation of the existing residents, as well as a potentially unlimited amount of agricultural structures which would significantly impact all the property's charter purposes and resources, but in particular its scenic areas, vistas, and aesthetic values. And just for reference, <coughs> the yellow circle on the map in front of you is the location of the und currently undeveloped uh, residential building envelope. Thirdly, the water rights are not tied to the property and can be sold off and if acquired for uses other than irrigation, would likely dry up the ranch in perpetuity. The drying up of the property would, Im would impact all the property's charter purposes and resources, but could also impact the underlying hydrology in this area, and by extension, charter purposes and resources on surrounding open space. Fourthly, under the development rights agreements, the Shanahan's retain their oil and gas rights on the west half of the property, which can be developed or leased. And finally, there's no requirement or obligation in the agreements for the property owner to keep the ranch and agricultural production are managed a particular way. And so, you know, we as a community have been fortunate that the Shanahan family has just demonstrated a land ethic, uh, you know, spanning many decades that's in line with OSMP's land ethic values and management practices, <coughs> but the development rights agreements do not guarantee that a future owner will share that same ethic and values and keep the property in agriculture. So those are the reasons why OSMP is recommending this acquisition. To recap, we're recommending that we acquire the 179 acres of land, the impertinent water and mineral rights, and the ranch headquarters, or to put it another way, everything that the city did not acquire through the 1985 development rights agreements uh, for $8 million. As discussed in the memo, the purchase will include a lease back to Lynn Shanahan, one of the owners who has lived on and managed the ranch with his wife Sandy since 1994, and are, who are here with us tonight, to help ensure the uninter uninterrupted and ongoing agricultural management of the property and provide some time for OSMP to develop a resource assessment and management recommendations. And so in closing, you know, we realize that this is an expensive acquisition and that we'll have spent down most of the carryover funding in our acquisition CIP that has enabled the department, department to make recent and high priority acquisitions during a period in time when the annual allocation to the acqu acquisition CIP budget has been decreasing. With that said, for the reasons I discussed in my presentation, OSMP and OSBT consider this opportunity to acquire Shanahan Ranch to, to not only be strategic, but of the highest priority and a worthy public investment uh, of these acquisition funds. And with that, I can take any clarifying questions. You wanna have any questions? <coughs> yep. Mary, then Aaron. So thank you for the presentation. Just um, a curious question. The um, 6.6, .6 million dollar price tag in 2008. Did that include water and mineral rights as well? It, it did, okay. yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Aaron? Yep. Thanks as well for the presentation. And so speaking of mineral rights, the, the um, we're purchasing the, the outstanding mineral rights from the owners, right? But does that include the mineral rights that are on the eastern portion of the property that the state land board 
it did not it does not include the um, the mineral rights owned by the state land board um, we've ver verified through our due diligence that there aren't any existing leases um, on the east half of the property um, but the state is generally resistant to divesting or selling their mineral interests and so that's a conversation that we'll continue to have with the state land board mm -hmm. uh, but past conversations haven't been successful to acquire those rights okay so we'll reach out to them and try to negotiate but you think our chances of getting those are based on staff's not experience great. yes i believe our chances would not be great and is that roughly the eastern half of the property that it's pretty much the eastern half the property is divided by two uh uh, sections and so it's uh, I believe it's section 16 where the state land board owns the, the mineral rights okay thank you and then um, in terms of the lease that we'd be offering it makes sense mm -hmm. and so would we uh, wait uh, to develop any passive recreation facilities until that lease was complete or would we conceivably do it before it was done we would most likely begin the planning process to a kind of explore stewardship and management that advances all charter purposes so including passive recreational opportunities um, but at least in the the short term uh, the intent is to kind of continue the current agricultural management and stewardship demonstrated by by lynn shanahan and his family and and, and sand his wife sandy sure in the short term i'm just trying to get the like would would we definitively wait to make any changes to the property until the the lease were done or do we uh, Dan Burke, Director, Open Space and Mountain Park. So uh, what the short-term lease will allow us to do is will allow the department to do what we call the, the uh, property integration process, which takes several years, takes planning. You, know, you bring in all your staff involving all the charter purposes, and you do a complete uh, inventory of the property, and then determine and you develop a, a management plan for that property. And uh, based on the queue of where this would fall, uh, that's something we're un uh, undergoing right now with Lippincott Ranch. Uh, soon to carry forward with poor farm wells property that type of process and because we have some things in front of us we are viewing that we're going to need all of this short-term lease period for us to uh, get that process underway and to complete it so uh, uh, the short-term lease will not prevent us or will not uh, um, uh, indicate that we shouldn't start that process but our expectation is um, that those two should come together at a, at a mutual uh, time frame the, uh, mm -hmm. the end of that uh, short-term lease and the end of the management process management process thank you for that Dan so it feels like a, enough time to complete that integration yeah process. we're really thankful that uh, Lynn and the family are willing to uh, uh, carry on because it gives us time without having to put the resources right into a property that we have yet to manage and 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 don't know as well as some of our other properties Perfect. thank you I have a quick kind of follow-up question um, was the vision for the passive recreation of that property included in the West Trail study area? No, it was not. Because it was privately owned, uh, the visions that we have typical with our trail study areas are, are lands that are under our ownership. Um, so we do not, um, unless it's something like a Boulder Valley comprehensive plan where you put big blobs or circles through certain areas for uh, potential trail connections. That's the type of scale that you would do for property that it isn't already under public ownership. Uh, but the detailed level of the West TSA, uh, that type of scale, uh, we did not enc uh, encumber any other private properties under that uh, plan. So that goes through a separate process for determining what Yes, it would be the uh, specific be property process. integration process where okay. we would look at that property and then look at the surrounding trails and look at potential connections. And that's where we would look at education, agriculture, um, uh, 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 passive recreation, and look at those details for that specific property. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mark? Um, I think this is a fantastic piece of property, and I'm, I'm enthusiastic about it, but I do have a couple of questions. Um, we previously purchased rights for about a million nine, did we not? Some development rights. So our all in on this is about $10 million. That is correct, yes. Did, for a property this encumbered uh, and restricted in its development capacity, is that price supported by any kind of appraisal or anything else? Yes, yeah, so um, since we've been in on and off again negotiations with the um, Shanahan family, especially since 2008, we have a number of appraisals on um, that were completed for this property, and so our 
um, purchase price is based on information from those appraisals as well as our, our real estate staff's understanding expertise in um, the real estate market here in, here in Boulder County and also the valuation of uh, the water rights. And, and am I reading your projection correct, your cash flow projection correct in that you're going to spend more on this property than you've budgeted for land acquisition for the next six years combined? Uh, there's a, a line item for uh, um, mm -hmm. acquisitions. Yeah, Mark, uh, so the $8 million acquisition, to give you a sense, this is the last year of our uh, acquisition plan update. Okay. So our, our acquisition plan update is from 2013 through 2019. So this is the kind of the culmination. And through that uh, council approved approve acquisition plan, we estimated that uh, we will be putting a roughly around give or take each of those years, 13 through 19, about $5 million in our acquisition CIP to support that plan. Moving off of that plan and moving into the master plan era, in the era where land management is more of our focus, not to say that acquisi key acquisitions that support management wouldn't happen, uh, we are gonna be considerably uh, decreasing our acquisition uh, 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 funds for CIP. For instance, in 2020, our, our the approved budget is $700,000 for our acquisition versus 5.4 million back in 2018, I believe. So that gives you the kind of scale uh, of how we built up to complete this acquisition plan, but moving into the master plan era, our plans are to uh, bring that number uh, down considerably from where it's been. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Rachel? Well, yeah, while you're still there, yeah. this is a little bit off topic maybe, but um, with the yourself, will there be a budget for, I mean, will we need to acquire land around there for, Um, it, are you saying if, if the open space department needs to do acquisition uh, of any of CU South or any other lands in that area? Um, well, like I said, we will, we're not completely, we're going to be using the 2020 CIP dollars that are allocated towards um, um, our acquisition fund with the carryover we still will have. And based on that fact that we got a council approval in 2017 to dispose of a residence, which the acquisition helped fund, we will have about 4.2 million in our acquisition fund moving forward. Um, and then every year we'd have the ability to um, put CIP dollars towards an acquisition fund as we see fit. So every year we, we evaluate things of where we're going. So if we know we have an acquisition on the horizon, uh, we would have the ability to scale that up. And I would also say that uh, the voters also approved authorization for bonding. So if we have a unique opportunity, um, we already have voter approval, but we could come to council and issue a bond if we don't have in that particular year the acquisition dollars to take it off. That would be another option we would have at our ability and we also could use the bumper mechanism, which is sort of a seller financed pay, it over, pay over time over 10 or 20 years. So there's, there's a number of creative ways that you can still complete, complete a high priority acquisition um, outside of just what's in that particular CIP at the given time. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I, I had a couple other that were sure. more for staff, probably. Okay. You, I mean, you're welcome to stay. Um, Going back to the threats that you listed, I was a little bit confused by the subdivision and, and how that could play out as sort of a threat. Like, my understanding is we could only build one other structure on that property, so I, I guess I don't understand the benefit totally of subdividing it, and would it be that there would be fences, or how would it be disruptive? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. So. The, the development rights agreements, they allow for the development of the currently undeveloped residential building envelope, which is in the southeast corner of the property, marked by that yellow circle, uh, and a um, certain amount of acreage or land with that building envelope. So that basically, if you if you were to have subdivision out here, out here the most likely scenario would be that southeast portion of the property would sub be subdivided from the rest, and then you'd be left with you know, a second parcel, probably a different ownership, um, that um, would have the existing residence that, that could be relocated or redeveloped anywhere on that remaining acreage. And, and the way the development rights or agreements are written, uh, the property as it's currently um, 
um, uh, delineated could be um, divided into to three parcels. One of those parcels, though, would be undevelopable. And so it's, it's likely that if that scenario were to play out, one of that undevelopable parcel would be um, become a part of one of the developable parcels, if that answers your question. And so I, I guess the, the concern with that is that um, by having, by having fr fences, by having that additional development, by having uh, those properties uh, owned by uh, at least two, potentially three different owners with different uh, management goals, uh, different stewardship and land ethic, uh, it could have a significant impact on the, char the property's charter purposes and, and resources. And so our, our current, uh, I know it's not a conservation easement, but something similar doesn't limit fences or, or things that would divide the property in uh, a way? It, it, it really doesn't. It's, um, it's, it's an older agreement and um, I, th I think the, the pressures that these types of properties are, are facing in uh, our community and Boulder County in general today weren't anticipated back in 1985, particularly uh, residential demand for agricultural properties. And then are, are there any limits to like how, how big those uh, homes could be, the, the two developable properties? And also you mentioned that the agricultural buildings could be built up. We don't have any limits on, I mean, could they cover the whole area with buildings? Uh, so to that last question, they couldn't cover the agricultural buildings. This is an unincorporated Boulder County, so be, it, the property would be subject to Boulder Land Use Code. Uh, and under Boulder Land Use co Code, our understanding is that you could, you know, a significant portion of this property could be uh, covered with agricultural um, buildings and structures. So think equestrian centers, riding rings, corrals, industrial sized greenhouses, um, things of that, that nature. As far as the, the, the residential areas, the existing residence and ranch headquarters area is not restricted at all. So it could be relocated uh, and redeveloped uh, to a maximum size that Boulder County would allow under county land use code. The development rights agreements do restrict the size of the uh, southeast building envelope to a certain uh, square footage. and. Um, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head. I believe it's about 3,000 square feet total, which would include, uh, I believe, a detached garage and a building. So I know it allows for up to three residential structures, one of them being a house, but I can't recall the exact square footage. Thanks, and then just one last threat that I was a little bit confused by is the oil and gas rights. Mm -hmm. We don't have anything in place right now that would, that, that serves as a, a limit or moratorium on the ability to use the property that way. So county? right now, um, um, like I believe Aaron asked, uh, the east half of the property, uh, we really don't have any control over the, the, the mineral rights since they're held by the state land board. Okay. On the west half of the property, the city owns all the mineral rights except for the oil and gas rights that were retained by the owners uh, at the time of the development rights agreement sale in 1985. We are acquiring those oil and gas rights as part of uh, this acquisition, but right now there isn't really anything in the development rights agreements that would uh, allow the city to prevent the uh, either the current owners or a future owner from developing or, or leasing those oil and gas interests on the west half of the property. Okay, thank you. Did you thank want you. to answer about the moratorium itself? Or kind of, I'm just, I, it, it's a more general question, I think, yeah. There is, the city does have a moratorium on oil and gas development, both in the city and the city lands outside the the city, the open space department also has a process for processing applications that is, a, that is intended, which we are, I think we're updating right now, intended to uh, protect open space lands. The state law though is pretty clear that uh, a, a mineral rights owner does have the right to go through your land if they have well under it. And um, the Supreme Court has struck down two moratoriums very similar to ours in Fort Collins and Longmont. So. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Good question. Is, yep. is there any, uh, practical danger of oil and gas use of any portion of this property? Has, has there been any indication that there are resources? Hi, Bethany Collins, a real estate supervisor for Open Space Mount Prex. Excuse me, I have a <laughs> cold. Um, uh, the, the geology in 
pretty much the entire front range, um, is likely that there is oil and gas under it. Um, however, the economics of getting to, because of the uh, geology there, the economics, it's just not feasible right now that an oil and gas company would, would be likely to develop in that area. Um, I will say um, a, a, a little bit differently than what Luke said, uh, State Land Board actually holds these kinds of assets specifically to sell them or to lease them. Um, it's their uh, mission to um, make money <laughs> um, for, for schools. Um, and to reinvest that money. And so they hold on to these. We can pursue these, whether or not they would sell them to us or hold on to them as an asset and thinking that down the road they may be worth more. Um, but we can approach them and see, and, and we have approached them already just to make sure that the the out, outdated lease was indeed terminated. Um, and so we can work with them on that eastern portion to, to also acquire the oil and gas. Um, in this area, actually, as you guys all know from Marshall and, and in that area, the, the coal was actually more of a risk, and so it's it's interesting that um, you know that that we now own the coal and everything in the area, but not the oil and gas. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so I have a question: Would it be possible, from a strategic standpoint, to acquire a lease over the um, development potential and essentially extinguish it because we wouldn't? do that? We could um, look at several options. We could even ask for a no, no, at least, a, at the very least, a no surface occupancy agreement from State Land Board. Um, that's a, a first step of, you know, if, if they were to somehow lease the minerals on their, uh, they all they typically always hold the um, mineral interests under Section 16 lands, um, you know, the patchwork of, of lands of the PLSS system. Um, and so they would um, very likely work with us to do at least a uh, surface use occupancy, I mean a no surface occupancy, which would mean that um, if they were to, you know, lease the minerals adjacent to the property and somebody could put, could develop from there, they could still get to the minerals under the property but not from the Shanahan Ranch property. So that's a step one if they weren't willing to lease the actual mineral, um, I mean sell the actual mineral interest to us. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? Okay. Thank you. I guess public comment, public hearing. Linda Parks, please come. Let us know your thoughts. Hi, Linda Parks, 2207 Mapleton Avenue. Welcome new members and welcome all members. I'm looking forward to seeing this 179 acres of the ranch property added to our open space in Mountain Park's portfolio of ag lands. And I think it is important that it remains agricultural in nature, protected for its ecological value, while also providing maybe passive recreational use. With no one condition, with no possible relocation of any prairie dogs to the property. Even though we have had the best intentions, our other agricultural lands in the OSMP portfolio are suffering. These properties were purchased for a lot of money and were once highly productive leased. Now they are ravaged dead and weed infested lands destroyed by a highly invasive plague, the prairie dog. Over a decade ago, our city council made the mistake of protecting the species. They may have thought they were doing the right thing. But had they really studied the impact of ranch lands and made a less emotional and more scientific decision, perhaps we would have arrived in a different place today. The environmental impact of that decision has led to the destruction of our ag lands and soils, along with the sensitive grassland ecosystem. The protection tied the hands of the leases and OSMP, the use of lethal means to control the numbers. So much time and taxpayers' dollars have been spent on relocation and dusting the lands with pesticides to prevent the plague. These pesticides affect bees, insects, and amphibians, and then the cycle begins again, destruction of soils and grasslands. OSMP officials have cited that Shanahan acreage includes tall grass prairie species like blue stem, switchgrass, and yellow Indian grass, valuable in its biodiversity, and providing protection of habitat for nesting songbirds like the grasshopper sparrow and amphibians. Boulder Valley Ranch and properties north on 63rd were once highly productive and healthy ag properties purchased in the OSMP portfolio. 
Is this the future of Shanahan Ranch? What about Gun Barrel Hills? These sensitive grasslands are now under attack as the encroaching north, south, and eastern colonies continue to grow. I see the front range coyotes dying off from mange, one lonely bobcat with a rabbit in its mouth from time to time, and a few birds of prey flying off with snakes and mice. It's not enough to control these prairie dogs. For over 20 years, I have boarded horses at Boulder Valley Ranch. As many of us wait patiently for some action to be taken, we watch once productive pastures become a wasteland. I hope that open space in Mountain Parks is prepared to keep this acreage from the same fate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to council. Any discussion? <coughs> Go ahead, Bob. I just wanna, I think the Shanahan family's here. I just wanna thank the Shanahan family for making this available to the community. If no one else has comments, I have a, a couple quick ones. Um, I think the five risks that are pointed out here are risks that we would probably like to not have for this property. I mean, we've been hoping to acquire this property for decades now, and this would be it, the kind of last hurrah with the current CIP approach, and so it's good that the money has been saved for it. Um, I'll also point out that given the development rights, even if you take the $10 million figure and you divide it by 179 acres, it's about $56,000 an acre, which is reasonable price, um, given that it doesn't have development rights, except for a few limited ones. So I think this is great. I thank um, staff for continuing to work with the Shanahan family, the Shanahan family for being willing to have this conversation over many decades and also being willing to help transition it into our ag program. And I think that'll be a really um, positive thing because it will support the other OSMP lands around it with connectivity and the kind of uses that are there now. So I'm gonna support this. Same guys. I agree with all that. And I just want to make uh, one comment just here. I, I noticed the, um, the proximity of this property to the, the CU South um, lands um, that we will be considering in various, talking about more about flood mitigation there in upcoming months. Just to think that um, this acquisition and some of the um, lands there, I did notice uh, there's potential Preble's jumping mouse habitat um, on this parcel. So I know there may end up being some impacts to open space on the Sioux South lands, and perhaps we can look for uh, opportunities to make up for that with this acquisition and, and uh, with some of the open space values on this, um, this property. Yeah. Uh, is somebody ready to make a motion? Move to approve the, to approve the acquisition. Second. Okay. It, it, and can I just offer a little friendly amendment, um, which is, I, I, Dan, I love that uh, idea of finishing out the, is it the integration process in the same time frame as the lease? So I just wonder if we might um, add to the motion an encouragement to really dovetail those things as staff is um, hoping to do so that the integration process is finished um, by the time the lease ends. If that's amenable to you. You agree with that? Yeah. So, okay. Um, is this, sh this show, of hands. show of hands? Okay. All in favor of the motion as amended, raise your hand. That's unanimous. So, congratulations. And thank you to the Shanahans again. I was just wondering if the Shanahans wanted to come up and make a comment at all. If you are, I invite you. If not, thank you very much. We appreciate what we've just acquired, so thank you. Any, you want to say anything? Cool. Nice job. <coughs> well, it's been a long time taking going through this. I uh, should be happy, but I'm not. <laughs> not. Mm. Went for my brother and sister, it wasn't been for sale, so. Hope we can work it out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Okay, and we will move on to our next public hearing. Your second public hearing is a motion to adopt resolution 1275, committing the city of Boulder to promote racial equity. 
and we're, we're pulling up a presentation, and this presentation will be made by Amy Kane. Hi. Amy. No. No one is. Now it is. Green light. Okay. Um, thank you all so much for having me. My name is Amy Kane, and I am a program manager with the city of Boulder. And I'm here to talk to you tonight about to help understand a little bit more about the city's racial equity efforts to date. Our partnership with the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, next steps with the racial equity work that has been going on with the city internally, and then um, the importance of the resolution that is before you this evening. So the Government Alliance on Race and Equity is a national ne network of governments, um, municipal governments who are working to achieve and advance racial equity um, and opportunities for all. This organization is a member, is a, when we joined back in 2018, there were about 150 communities as members and now they're up to about 200. And we rely on this national network um, for providing us support and resources as we continue our racial equity efforts moving forward. As partners with the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, we have um, at our fingertips lots of training that we can participate in for city staff and for leadership, as well as best practice research um, in public policy and um, items, resources like the racial equity instrument, which the city staff have been working to pilot in different um, areas, implicit bias areas within the organization. So the GARE model for change starts with normalizing, and so that's really creating a shared um, analysis and definitions of what is racial equity, what is institutional racism, and how does that contribute to structural race racism. This really helps guide city staff in understanding the urgency and the importance, as well as city leadership, in the work that is ahead. Um, as local governments, we're the ones who created um, racial inequities, and it's up to government employees and government agencies to really help um, help change that. We've been in a process most recently of organizing, and that's really creating the internal infrastructure that will set us up for success, as well as going into community um, partnerships. So with other community organizations who are focusing on advancing racial equity, we've been really focused on, on building those partnerships and relationships because we know that in order to change things structurally, we really need to be building those partnerships. And now we are really going into the operationalized um, phase where we are implementing those racial equity tools and instruments to be applied to programs, policies, and budget making decisions as we go forward in the work as an organization. This is a cyclical model, so it does go around and round. And what we're talking about in the normalizing phase as part of that tonight is the um, racial equity resolution that's before you. <coughs> Moving forward, uh, there's been a lot of work that's been going on over the past um, couple of years, which is outlined in the memo that you all had in your packets. But moving forward, um, there is continued training for leadership and city staff. Um, we are working to get right use of power training for all city council members, um, and we're anticipating that training to start in 2020. Advancing racial equity, the role of government, um, at the time that you were sent your packet, we had 119 people who had participated in that training. We are requiring that training for all city supervisors, all of our fire staff, um, also for our council members, and that will be an additional 325 participants beyond the 119 um, who we put in the memo to date. We are also just went under contract um, to have mandatory bias and microaggression training for all city staff, council, and our boards and commissions. That will start with a focus group process um, so our consultants can really understand the culture internally um, and the different businesses that exist within the city of Boulder government. And then we're anticipating about mid-2020 to roll that training out with a train the trainer model. Also moving forward, the city um, staff have been working on drafting a racial equity plan outline based on feedback from the 2017 Community Perceptions Report, as well as the March 18th community listening session that we had, as well as um, just the stories and um, the personal relationships that we've been making with community members over the past couple of years to really understand the inequities that we've been creating 
um, since we've been in existence. Um, that uh, community, or that racial equity plan outline is going to be going before community probably in 2020 um, because that's an element where we really need to have community feedback um, and that um, plan itself um, really outlines specific strategies and goals and action items that affect the policies and the policy areas um, that we lead as a government agency. It also will have specific actions, but as I said, because we are doing a robust community engagement, the outline that's going out to community at the beginning of 2020 really only highlights some of the action items. This isn't a done deal. We anticipate that there are a lot, we'll get a lot of feedback from community, and we wanna make sure that those voices are heard and incorporated in that equity equity plan. Um, we also, after the goals, strategies, and action items are created, there will be a creation of metrics um, to hold ourselves accountable to ensure that we are really moving this work forward and making real true difference and change. Um, also, uh, along with that is um, a robust timeline. So we have been working with a community racial equity engagement working group, and that is a group of seven community members who've been helping us design that community engagement process. We're about halfway through that process currently. We'll be reconvening after the holidays, after the first of the year, to finalize what that engagement looks like. And I think some of our team members are in the audience tonight, so. Thank you for that. Um, moving on, so the resolution. The resolution that bef is before you is really an opportunity as leaders for you to um, really give that leadership support so staff can put together the resources, the time, and the energy to ensure that this work moving forward is successful and that it is a priority for you all as leaders of our organization. So with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Any questions? Yeah. Any? Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. It's very inspiring. Um, but I think the question that I have for you, because mm -hmm. you mentioned a lot the word community. Yes. And you know, when we think of the word community, we think outreach, we think yes. a lot of people getting together, but sometimes within that, we can miss out on the specifics. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's what I, did, I didn't get really from you yeah. here today, because <coughs> I read some of the emails that were sent in, mm -hmm. and one person mentioned sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to hear from you when you talk about community is did you reach out to the LGBTQAI community? Did you reach out to the Latino community, mm -hmm. not just the community as a whole? Because I think it's very important to be very specific right. in when we mention the word community. Yes, yeah. I would agree with that, absolutely. So. Yes, we have. Um, the community um, engagement that happened with the Community Perceptions Report really gave um, feedback that the, the white population in our community often feels very safe, very comfortable, very welcome, and very unaware of how others in our community um, feel. We are very focused with the work that we've been doing on racial equity, um, and that is a very kind of gear model. And the reason that we start with race and focus on race is so that we can apply the concepts and learnings to other marginalized communities. So I will say that the most of the members of the um, racial equity engagement working group are a group of Latinx community members who've been participating in this process. So we're being very intentional to design design that um, community engagement process on the racial equity outline on what different stakeholders are involved in the community and what community engagement process works best for that specific community. Thank you, Junie. Aaron? Yeah, I, I also um, thank you for all that, Amy. You're welcome. Um, also wanted to uh, call out the email that we got from a Mr. Fishman, um, uh, bringing up yes. the, the question of the language around um, saying uh, sexual orientation and not preference. Yes. And uh, I know the the resolution that we're talking about from 2001 used that that other language. Correct. But, um, do you see any issue? Um, can we not just change the language to uh, in the new resolution to say orientation rather than preference? I thought it was an excellent point. Thought in the new one, it did say up. So I downloaded my packet yeah. while traveling, Good so job. I may, I may <laughs> not have gotten the most recent one. Let me look at that. We can absolutely do that. Yes. Okay. If it Great. is not already there. 
And is the what, is there something more recent, a more recent version of the resolution than what's on the kind of current um, agenda? The most recent one um, is on the racial equity website, as well as should have been in your packet. I'm going to go download that right now, just in case it's updated. Hey, Aaron, I did read it today, and from what I saw, it was updated. So okay, great. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. But, I don't but it was referring to another. Yeah. It that was, was a past resolution. Yes. And so I don't know how you change that one. That would be a that would be a question for my esteemed colleague. <laughs> Me? Oh. <laughs> so you can um, you can always vote to amend the resolution. So you could just say we're uh, you could add to this motion we're amending resolution whatever number it is by changing uh, sec sexual preferences to sexual orientation. Um, and you could probably do that. you can do that in this motion I would think. Yeah. That's what I was going to think to Rachel. I also thank you for that presentation and all the work that you've been doing um, in, in light speed over the last couple weeks. <laughs> um, a couple questions. For the trainings that are going to apply to city council in particular, there was bias and microaggression and some sort of power light dynamic. Use power training. Training. Yeah. Are those going to be mandatory in the resolution? They are not currently mandatory in the resolution. Okay. So I, I guess I have a question, and that may be to to co-counselors whether it's going to be mandatory and then you also talked about metrics and a timeline and I wasn't sure when that information is available like when will we have the the metrics that will show whether we are complying with our own resolution as I understand it so um, the metrics are going to be for the racial equity plan and those action items there um, those won't be ready until we determine what those goals strategies and action items are with the community involvement because we can't set metrics without having those completely firmed up. So th that's what that is referring to. Okay, yeah. thanks. The resolution itself really lends the support to continue the work with the racial equity plan and training and all that good stuff. Okay, any other questions? Mary? I don't have a question. I just wanted to recognize the working group that's been put, working on the um, community engagement. And um, if you guys would just like to stand up and be recognized, um, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. And Mary, on that note, I think it's worth noting that there are two groups here. There's the working group that is focused on community engagement and the guiding coalition. Yeah. And the guiding coalition in 2018 was, I think, seven people, and now we've added five council members, so it will be more than that. So just as a, um, a note to the, the community to make the distinction between those two different groups. Correct. The, um, the guiding coalition is um, council members and city staff consisting of um, directors and uh, people in the city manager's office as well as two council members until the recently elected council which will have five council members on the guiding coalition so Thank you. it's exciting good Rachel I had one more question Yes, I think it was on page 112 of the big packet um, when we're talking about training is it going to be ongoing or like annual Ongoing training, yes. Um, the training for 2021 hasn't been fully outlined um, because it is so robust with the advancing racial equity training and the right use of power training. It'll likely be that the microaggression and bias training, depending on how what guidance we get from our guiding coalition, happens towards the end of 2020 or beginning of 2021. And I anticipate when working with the guiding coalition that there will be other um, training needs that, that come to the surface. So I would just like to add to that that um, I had an opportunity to um, look at the proposal for the right use of power, and it is really, really time intensive um, and will require a huge commitment from all of us and um, as well as um, staff members. And yeah. um, and so that's, that's um, part of what the guiding coalition needs to take a look at is the, the the time commitments that we'll be making as we move through these processes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. 
additional follow-up to that question. Yeah. So when new staff members come on, do we have a plan for that? Yes. Since, yeah. So for our, all of our new staff members, um, in addition to all the supervisors who are currently going through advancing racial equity, the, equity, the role of government training, um, any city staff is welcome to participate in that training as, as well as um, city staff who have signed up to be part of the racial equity core teams. And these are city staff members who have committed 10 hours per month to help um, build out programs and trainings and other pro project areas that help support some of the work of the racial equity plan outline, um, as well as just where we need to go internally as an organization. That is also going to now be hosted for um, all new employees starting in 2020. They will go through that training. Uh, bias and microaggression training, the reason that we are designing it with a train the trainer model is so that we have a capacity to keep the, the training going on ongoing as folks transition in and out of the organization. Yeah. Mark? In drafting resolution 1275, I, I noticed that it's almost entirely focused on process, and that until you get to attachment C in, say, section 2.4, you don't see specific goals of where we're supposed to go mm -hmm. with all of this. And, and was that a strategic decision that you made, or, uh, I mean, it, it seems to me that, that our resolution could incorporate some of those goals in 2.4, because that's the end product that we want to get to. So the goals will be heavily with community involvement, with the racial equity planning process. The resolution is truly an opportunity for leadership support and a commitment to the work that the council is really gonna focus on. Okay. And this is also, I'd like to point out, one of many resolutions that I anticipate um, council will be adopting in this space moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And, and again, just to try and be clear, you said this in your presentation, but we have the resolution that we are going to pass if we decide to tonight, right. and then we have this outline, mm -hmm. and that outline will get, that's where the specifics come yes. in, that's where the metrics come in, that's where the community engagement at length comes in that the working group will help with. So again, to break things into two distinct parts, we have the statement of intent tonight, and then get community feedback on what the specific actions to be taken are. And I would add that that's pretty common practice. Um, <coughs> their communities, usually their leadership, their mayor, their councils, um, make either a declaration, a resolution, or a statement of support. And this is the opportunity for you all to do that. Anything else from council? Okay, ready for our public hearing. And how many total are there? Like 13. 13, okay. So you'll have three minutes to speak. Um, and we will start with Anna Seger, followed by Katie, Katie Farnan and Nicole Perelman. Uh, Hola, buenas noches, uh, miembros, estimados miembros del Consejo Municipal. Mi nombre es Ana Segur. He venido aquí a hablar en español uh, para destacar lo um, poco preparado que estamos aquí en la ciudad de Boulder para atender a la población latina. Um, según el censo más reciente que se ha llevado a cabo, eh, esa población representa aproximadamente un 10% de la población aquí en Boulder. Uh, y aunque es eh, un, una población significativa aquí en Boulder, um, esa población existe um, eh, de una forma invisible para muchos de, de las personas aquí en Boulder. Son las personas que lavan los trastes en los restaurantes, que palean las nieves, que limpian los jardines, las casas. Y um, esa población también enfrenta otra realidad económica que la población Uh, no hispanohablante, eh, ellos ganan aproximadamente o menos que la mitad de, la, de los hogares uh, no hispanohablante aquí en Boulder. Um, yo he llegado a tener un poco de conocimiento de esa población a través del trabajo que he estado haciendo um, eh, con una organización que recibió fondos de la ciudad de Boulder para lanzar un programa de salud de equidad. 
y o equidad de salud eh, un programa de fútbol y he estado encargado de ser como una embajadora comunitaria para la, para la población latina eh, durante los últimos 11 meses Um, he llegado a conocer que la mayoría de la población latina aquí en Boulder es formada de mexicanos, mayormente de Zacatecas, la región, el estado de Zacatecas en México, um, que la mayoría de esa población están radicadas en los um, parqueros de tráileres en el norte y el este de Boulder. Uh, las familias no usan el correo electrónico, prefieren el, la comunicación por texto y um, le, le prefieren recibir información de uh, fuentes de confianza, organizaciones y personas que son de confianza para ellos. Y basado en esa experiencia que yo he tenido, um, yo creo que si la ciudad de Boulder quiere llegar a conocer las necesidades de, de esa población, tiene que hacer un cambio en los procesos y la forma que trabajan. Que tienen que um, llevar, yo recomiendo que lleven las reuniones hacia los parqueaderos, ofrecer servicios de traducción, um, ofrecer los programas de texto en español, no solo el opt-in y opt-out en español, um, contratar más personal eh, hispanohablante y trabajar con un, organizaciones comunitarias como El Paso, Centro Amistad e Intercambio que ya están conocidos. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ana. Um, Katie Farnan and then Nicole Perelman. Thank you for your presentation, Amy. Uh, and I want to say I appreciate Council bringing up this resolution in a timely manner. I appreciate Council's willingness to open this discussion and make it a priority. Um, and I think we all acknowledge that this is a first step. I'm happy to hear about the involvement of community in this process and that there will be measurable metrics as a part of this. I and I think others have a um, bit of a worry about step two, and you might also. Um, but what comes next and how binding is this resolution? Because that's the thing you're voting on. Um, you know, where does real accountability feature into this? And what specific policy directives are guiding the language of the resolution? Um, you know, are we ready to be directly <coughs> accountable for this work? Are we ready to put that into writing and vote on that as such? Because I worry about the intent is being voted on. That's what a resolution is. It's a, it's, it's intent. but. The details follow, and, and I don't know that you're voting on those kinds of things, so I don't know exactly, you know, you have this resolution and then you move into work that, I'm going to be hopeful about that. Um, but I do want to say as part of this resolution, I'm here specifically to ask that council include something in the process that I and fellow Boulder residents have been recently bringing up in this forum, which is a comprehensive audit of all citywide departments looking at existing policies, contracts, and other rules that are on the books that might be in direct conflict with Boulder's commitment to sanctuary city status. Um, there's a line running from that sanctuary declaration of 2017 directly to this racial equity resolution. And we have an obligation to strengthen both of the, these documents, the one that was already voted on and this one, to give both documents substance and actual authority that they need to be effective and reparative and also that there's accountability in there. Um, that's just important, and, and this is something that's now two years in, and I just think it's time to look at that again, especially as you're, you're focusing on racial equity. Also want to agree with Junie um, that we should be proactively reaching out to community groups directly impacted by racial um, inequity. Um, and I'm glad to hear that that's been, been going on. And I would add that ongoing training as a mandatory requirement should be a part of that resolution. Um, I've taken racial, racial bias training and having resources like what GARE is offering is a literal gift. I mean, it is a gift to be able to learn and grow in this way, especially if you're in a position of power, no matter how local that is. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, Nicole Perelman and then Nikhil Mankakar and then James Feeney. Thanks everyone for the opportunity to be here tonight. I could save my time and basically just say, 
everything that the previous speaker just said, because <laughs> it was spot on and fantastic. Um, a couple of things. I was sitting here trying to think of a good analogy about this process and what's going on that would be sort of a bolder analogy. And I was thinking the best one I could come up with is you guys are doing great work. This is really important. And right now you have a tricycle, but it could become a Prius. That was the best <laughs> bolder analogy I could come up with. <laughs> um, but basically to get there, you need to do the things that, that Katie, just the previous speaker, just outlined. Um, you know, we have something here that's full, a lot of in, full of intent. It, this was a fabulous um, presentation. I learned so much tonight. It sounds like there's so many great things coming, but I also share the concerns that as things are worded now, they might be a little bit big or a little bit squishy, and so I would want to make sure that there's a genuine commitment here, um, and just get more specific, because that's how you're going to get the Prius. Um, and when I think of the Prius, I was doing some reading yesterday and today about Portland and all the things that they've done, and I don't know if the council members or staff have had a chance to take a look at it, but it's really comprehensive and it's really cool. Um, they've involved everyone, all different communities in the process. Um, they've worked equity lens into budgeting, into city contracting, into bandage training for employees, you know all this, and to work with police in terms of having scorecards and accountability. And I think that's what Boulder could have, um, and I would just encourage you to get a little bit more um, specific so that this isn't just something right now at this stage that's feel good, that it's really going to be something that's uh, binding and meaningful. Uh, and I guess in closing, I would just um, want to also echo what Katie had said about taking a look at the sanctuary city status. I've um, spoken before this group before about the concerns the community has um, in particular particular about uh, BI in town that's owned by the GEO group and treatment of, of asylum seekers. Um, and that remains a concern. And we have other tech companies in town too that are coming to my attention that are um, maybe involved with not so great things with uh, immigrants and asylum seekers. And if we really are going to be a sanctuary city, I think we do really need to take a comprehensive look at that. And this to me seems like a perfectly logical and natural place to do all that and fold it in. So thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. So glad that the city's working on this, and I know it's a lot of work. Thank you. Nikhil Mankakar, followed by James Feeney. <coughs> Hello, good evening. I'm Nikhil Mankakar. I'm the chairman of the City of Boulder Human Relations Commission. Um, I trust you all received the letter uh, sent to council on behalf of the commission in support of this resolution. So uh, I'll speak tonight and uh, move away from some of those topics. Uh, one, I and the Human Relations Commission support this as an important step, and we recognize it as a step uh, in a long process. But every step is important, including the ones that you may have taken before. So I'm happy to see the inclusivity resolution uh, we made as a city in 2015 now included in this resolution and being uh, really committed to. Um, it's important to specify that in uh, this resolution and the racial equity plan that when we say city, we more often than not mean city government as an organization and not to confuse that with the, uh, the larger community in the city. Um, I will also note I'm on the out outreach and engagement team for that racial equity plan, uh, and things have been going well with us, and I believe we will uh, do a good job with the staff on uh, uh, bringing in the broader community for input into that plan and, and that action plan, specifically uh, underrepresented voices. Um, I feel lucky to be able to know about what is happening on the inside within the city government and the significant steps toward, towards racial equity uh, being taken in a comprehensive manner that I find impressive. Um, it's just, we have to see follow through on the plan, um, but I think it will eventually extend to um, all aspects of the city as an organization. Um, I'm hopeful because of all of the great, uh, when we talk about action steps and follow through, I feel hopeful because of all of the uh, great work on racial and social equity that I've been uh, fortunate enough to be uh, a part of um, with many of the councils uh, as chair of the commission, including a living wage policy, establishing and growing Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, and the ongoing uh, tribal consultations we have uh, in 2018, changing and expanding our city human rights protections and housing, employment, and public accommodations to protect undocumented community members and Section 8 voucher, voucher holders, and just a few months ago, um, our city changes to use appropriate gender language and city code and documents and the municipal hate crimes law updates, which give us one of the best tools in the country for law enforcement to combat bias-motivated hate crimes in the community, and honestly, there's just so much, so much more that I could name. Um, but. Uh, 
I don't know, I think it's just from being so closely involved in these that I, I, it does give me hope uh, with these things. I've been getting a lot of feedback about, you know, we've passed these these resolutions before, what do they mean? You have one from 2001, uh, now we now have one from 2015. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's good to make note of all of these positive steps towards equity and inclusion in the community and hope to see them continue. Um, outside of my role in HLC, I've been lucky to be um, to, included, I feel included and, and, and trusted and respected by council and, and especially the staff. So I often wind up getting to be the, the extra invisible city staff on, on things and I've seen a lot of good happen. Um, this last comment is that um, I just wanna, I think this resolution and the steps we've seen taken can give hope to the Boulder community and all communities um, to just keep taking steps, small and big, uh, but keep taking them and have hope um, because transformation can happen and impossible is possible. I look at where I was in my life and the city was a decade ago. I talked about some of this uh, when the hate crimes law passed, but I look at where the city as, as an organization, my community, the broader community is at and where I am at. And so um, I know change can happen and sometimes things may seem impossible, but they can happen um, as long as good people come together to do them. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. <clears throat> James Feeney. I'm James Feeney from North Boulder. Uh, reading through the council uh, resolution, uh, there's a lot of references to racial equity, but uh, I didn't see anything really about class equity. Um, and so assuming we're not going to discriminate against people based upon economic and ethnic criteria, then maybe we wanna broaden uh, the language. Um, the resolution talks about uh, equity but fails to say much about uh, responsibility and accountability, which uh, other people have uh, brought up. Um, there's lots of trainings and partnerships and workshops and studies and there's nothing about the essentials of change, which uh, Councilmember Wallach mentioned. Uh, there's an aphorism that says change requires change. What exactly is gonna change here? Um, here, City Council is a TV show. Uh, there's a camera, uh, people can watch on Channel 8. Uh, we have a studio audience, uh, there are recurring guest appearances. Uh, city Council members act essentially as passive observers with voting rights. Uh, our TV critics sit in the back of the room and every week they carefully edit a show narrative for the local newspaper. And all the while, uh, the show producer orchestrates the performances scripted by an extensive writing staff. Uh, if you wanna see the fabric and substance of prejudice and discrimination, you look no further than uh, the city council chambers. I come here and ask simply that uh, council enforce the ordinances and what happens? Uh, the only response is talking in circles, blank stares or silence. Uh, we must study, study, study and do nothing, you say, and you discount racism with throwaway logic saying, we're all racist, so no one's racist. Uh, everyone has suffered, so no one has suffered. Uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, just not anytime soon. Uh, don't go away angry, just go away. Uh, you can ignore the law and treat the law with contempt when it doesn't fit your ideology. Uh, your officers treat me with insult and contempt. They ignore me, I'm invisible, I don't exist. Uh, but the real world doesn't happen in the city council chambers, it happens on the streets of the city. It happens at the hands of the city's police, administrators, inspectors, and clerks. Uh, city policy is embodied in the action of those boots on the ground. And in the real world, apparently, there's no change. We just have business as usual, where to paraphrase, the only business of government is business. Uh, change requires change. If you wanna see real change, uh, I think you need to look at uh, changing your chief executive and your chief prosecutor. Yes, uh, James, you have a question. Thank you so much for this presentation you just gave. I think it's it's really amazing, it's great. Um, but I think you also talked about intersectionality, which is very important to me. And I think one question that I had for you, because you mentioned accountability, of, a lack of accountability within the resolution, and I wanted to know what do you mean by that? Yeah. Well, if there's going to be a shift in uh, whether it's racial equity or class equity, uh, then something tangible needs to change. And so until you're talking to the people who are impacted, 
So sometimes, for instance, I've heard people come up here and say that, uh, well, you don't understand when I go into the grocery store and somebody demands uh, a receipt before I can leave the store. Um, that's a specific event. And it's something that uh, if we're going to change not just within the city government, but within the community at large, uh, the, the way people are treated moment to moment, then first you have to recognize that uh, this event is happening to somebody because I don't experience that. I can't appreciate it. I'm lucky that I, you know, even aware of it. So people first have to show up explain those things and then they have to be specifically addressed. Thank you, James. So I will make a comment here around the specifics question that we have an attachment in our packet, attachment C, which is the outline. And so if, if the community who's watching has only focused on the resolution, many of the specifics that we expect to come from this program are in the outline. So next we have Sammy Lawrence, Carrie Miller, and John Tayer. Is back, back again. <clears throat> so I want to actually take this moment in time to bring up an interesting conversation I had outside with Mr. Stone. Uh, two quotes came to mind in regards to this dialogue um, from Avatar: The Last Airbender, not the movie, the show. Uh, one. It is best to admit mistakes when they occur, and to seek to restore honor. And on that note, I apologize, Mary Young, for my comment earlier. That was racist, and that was wrong. To own and have accountability is key and important. And as I said in my earlier comments and public comments, it's scary. I would hope that we remember, once again, that when we were youth and we were open to being accountable from our elders and our parents as younglings. Likewise, I also echo requests of accountability for these, this, this, um, this thing that we are creating, that city council is creating. I speak to it specifically as a man who experienced a type of racial discrimination basically that we're speaking to at this very podium. When I spoke about what I experienced in April, when I had five city council members, two of which that spoke to watching the video and approving of what happened to me, basically justify me speaking to you in distress and anxiety from not only having a damaged brain, but likewise the anxiety of speaking publicly about something that traumatized me. <clears throat> likewise, actions afterwards were a bit ridiculous. I would hope and pray that we as a community, especially people who are our leaders, can be accountable and seek to be truly and fully accountable. I say this not only as a member of this community, but as a former youth commissioner in Sacramento, California. These are things that I had to do. And when I was young, I came to this posi that position with that mindset. I hope and pray that in the future, when people speak to atrocities that they've experienced in life to this council, that they do not experience the same thing I experienced. No one deserves that. And I will be speaking about this maybe one or two more times in the future as I garner my healing from this instance, because I will have my healing and I will be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. Uh, Carrie Miller and John Tayer and Jeff Hirota. Hi. 
good evening. First off, it's really hard to follow someone as eloquent as Sammy, so I just want to say thank, thank him for speaking. As well as Nicole and Katie and everyone before me, I'd like to echo a couple of things and add a couple of things to what they've said. First and foremost, I'd like to call attention to the first sentence of the resolution, which states that the Boulder community has long benefited, benefited from the beautiful and natural surroundings that were originally the home of Southern Arapaho, Cheyenne, and several other tribes. And I just want to call your attention to the fact that that's written in past tense. That's also present tense. This is still stolen land regardless of how comfortable you are on it. I also just want to echo specifically about the audit um, that's been mentioned prior. I think it's really important that it's said that it should be a third party audit, someone who's not involved. If our own are auditing our own, it's not as effective. Um, I'd also just like to call attention to the recent audits in Charleston, South Carolina for, uh, inter for racism within their city as well as Charlotte, North Carolina have really produced some wonderful uh, efficient and comprehensive citywide and agency-wide aud audits from third parties, as well as calling attention to the Portland audit was third party as well. Um, I'd also like a, to call attention to the publication like a, uh, like a Loaded Weapon, the Rehnquist Court, Indian Rights, and the Legal History of Racism in America, which was a book written in 2005 by uh, Dr. Will Robert Williams. And I just think all of you as your uh, in the positions that you're currently in should take a minute to read this book. Um, it really calls attention to the importance of language, the importance of language in terms of the legal racism that's occurred within our city and within the country of the US. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. John Tayer, Jeff Hirota, and then Claudia Hansen theme. Um, John Tare, Boulder with the Boulder Chamber, and this is a statement of commitment to partnership from the Boulder Chamber with the City of Boulder in their racial equity efforts. Um, I stand here before you humbled by the subject of racial equity and the work of City Council tonight to help launch another chapter in our efforts to right the wrongs of the past and to create a more equitable, inclusive, and welcoming community. The fact is that race, race relations, and racial equity are subjects that have challenged all of us here in this room, either because you bear the legacy of having contributed or benefited from positions of authority based on racial bias or mistreatment, and or you have suffered degradation, mistreatment, or worse from our nations and communities tainted history of racial inequality. I am humbled because I can't claim myself or on behalf of, a, of the Boulder Chamber organization I represent that I know precisely how to address the past sins nor the best path forward toward racial equity. What I can say is that the Boulder Chamber is committed as an organization to the same journey toward racial equity that City Council is exploring tonight for our membership, for our local businesses, and for the community we serve. Of course, we recognize that mere words and statements of commitment are not enough. Actions will tell the real story, and with that, the Boulder Chamber has started its journey with initial actions designed to, to make a positive contribution to our community's racial equity goals. Example steps we've taken include evaluating diversity, inclusivity, and equity as a top strategic goal or elevating goal for our organization as fully supported by the Boulder Chamber staff and board of directors with planning for specific actions and outcomes. Building a more diverse board of directors, which we have increased to 30% from people who identify as people of color and 35% who are from underrepresented populations through thoughtful and expanded outreach. Adopting new hiring practices based on skills and credential versus credentials that are designed to help us recruit a more diverse workforce while also enhancing recruitment outreach through community partners. Instituting ongoing staff education in areas such as bias, equity and inclusivity, LGBT and LGBTQ sensitivity. And we are also continuing our proud partnership with the Community Foundation serving Boulder County and our Leadership Fellows Program that at its core supports and enables inclusive leadership. I began my comments by noting that I come before you humbled by the subject you are addressing tonight. I am humbled because I know the list of actions and steps I just outlined is not enough. A resolution is not enough, though an important step, step the Boulder Chamber supports, and my testimony is not enough. 
We have great work to do as a community to move forward um, toward a more just and equitable society. And I know that the work that includes the Boulder Chamber is a partner with the City Council, the residents and citizens and business of, the, of Boulder. It's a journey and we will stumble along the way. Let's be direct when we fail to meet expectations, that is fair. But let's all come together in a spirit of listening and learning from each other and being clear about our intentions as through this resolution as we work to make this community that, that lives its vision of inclusion, diversity, and equity. Thank you. Thank you, John. Jeff Heroda and then Claudia Henson theme. <clears throat> Good evening, Council. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm Jeff Hirota. I'm with the Community Foundation Boulder County and just wanted to lift up um, the Foundation's vision of equity, which we uh, define as creating systems where all can thrive, and our core principles of prioritizing those most impacted by inequity, uh, something we call do nothing about us without us, which is trusting the lived experience, wisdom, and agency of those who know most about the issue, and then finally working in partnership with others, which is where uh, we want to affirm the city's commitment to the advancement of racial equity. Um, the Community Foundation's commitment to equity exists through its strategic plan and its goals, uh, reforming its own practices, aligning its own programs and grants uh, to equity, um, working in partnership on equity itself and issues like these, and also working with our donors. We hope that if we proceed with this work with some humility, we may be granted some grace along the way because we are very much in a spirit of learning and partnership and appreciation with you and the people and organizations who are working to advance equity. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Claudia. Good evening, members of council. Claudia Hansen theme I live in Boulder. Um, I had the privilege of reviewing the equity resolution with a small group of people who have been learning, teaching, and doing anti-racism work for many years and in many capacities in our community. And I'm speaking tonight not because I'm an expert on these issues, I'm absolutely not, but because I understand that it's time for more people in Boulder to show up for racial justice and equity. So it's in that spirit I wanna share some of the responses that people generously shared with me. You've heard some of these ideas woven into comment already tonight in statements from Anna, Katie, Nicole, James, and Sammy. You may have also seen them in an email sent on behalf of Boulder Progressives, which had several representatives at the review meeting I attended. To echo these voices, I'd like to ask you to do more work on this resolution before proceeding. I do appreciate Council Member Young for bringing this work forward at a critical time for Council. Thank you for accelerating this. We need concrete things like this to further difficult conversations in the community. But I don't think that a hasty signing is an effective, responsible, or respectful response to structural racism and its impact in our community. So please don't sign this resolution just to feel good about it and be done with it. I'd also ask you to take time to address two things that are not fully fleshed out in the resolution. The first is accountability, several people have mentioned. It's not enough to simply direct staff to use an equity lens and to anticipate more resolutions in the future. At a minimum, we need some way to measure our progress that is a way to evaluate the efforts that we're taking and the effects that they have in the community. So as others have proposed, some kind of a scorecard to track progress in different policy areas would be helpful. And I know there are some suggestions in attachment C of your packet, but you're not voting on those tonight. <coughs> The second thing my conversation group talked about is community leadership, and I appreciate the considerable work that staff has done here on education and training so far, um, but the work thus far has largely been defined and directed by the city at this point, and ultimately it's the community, and particularly communities of color, that should be involved in defining the problems and the desired outcomes that we have as a city in different policy areas. I know the city has started to do this with the engagement working group, and I hope that continues beyond just um, generating outreach plans. Deep inclusion is important to build trust and to engage the wealth of knowledge of people that we often exclude. So, um, as with all things justice related, it is important to act with urgency here, but I'd also ask that you please listen to members of the community who deserve depth, sincerity, and accountability from this process. 
Um, when we do empty things, and by that I mean things that are not binding on us, we can cause more harm in this community. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, Brooke Stableford and then Lynn Siegel. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah Don. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was really helpful. Kind of a plot twist in what I was going to say, so I'm going to um, bring some of the things that have come up for me. We, um, you know, at the university have required trainings, and I just feel like that should be true for our city council as well. And really looking at it as leadership development and um, that this is the world that we live in. You know, as we battle climate change, it is also uh, interlinked because of intersectionality. Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw is really fun to follow and her work um, is, is really important to this conversation. Junie, thanks for bringing that up too. Um, I also have some hesitancy around committing to this. I want to see it, and um, you know, I think because there's the opportunity for amendments, um, that there's some more, like, to add some accountability and consequences if we don't um, do the things that make us uh, capable and confident leaders in our city. And so, um, the opportunities to to add more to this is really important um, for that conversation. I, I've been going through the website more and um, did miss some of those things. I don't know if that was what CPAC it was, um, some of that, but it was really inspiring. I do l look at those trainings and think this is awesome, but it's kind of like CPR. If this is just once a year, um, or is there an enhancement, does there need to be an enhancement in the budget to make sure that this is training for expanding into staff and future for the next 10 years? You know, is this, all the metrics that are listed, is that just budgeted for this next year? Because it is a lot of time um, and an investment, but we, we, we get CPR trained every two years if we're providing care, right? So we just, we, we white people don't got this, like after one training, it is an ongoing lifetime commitment to anti-racism and anti-oppression. And so I really wanna see this in the develop, leadership development protocol that we just know that our city council is getting this every, year um, and for it to be intersectional. Thank you. Thank you, Zerdon. Brooke Stableford, then Lynn Siegel. Good evening, Council. Brooke Stableford, thank you everyone for being here. Welcome new members and welcome back incumbents. Uh, I wanted to ask City Council to pause the process and not yet sign. This is not quite a resolution because it's not a firm decision to do or not do something, it does not include a concrete plan or accountability. Council needs to do a full diversity and inclusion training so that they understand what they're assigning, otherwise it's not really in good faith. So please slow the process down and I really request that you speak with communities of color to hear firsthand their experience. And it's imperative to truly understand the experience of racial oppression in Boulder, both lived day to day as well as the experience of growing up and living in a family that has experienced generational racial oppression and denial of opportunity. And contrast this to the white privilege that most people of Boulder enjoy on a daily basis, unaware that white privilege exists, nor of the harm that it causes. And equity is key. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brooke. Lynn Siegel. Lynn Siegel, 538 Dewey. I think if you really want to do something, do reparations. I support reparations. But there's deeper things going on in our culture that, are, and this is an illusion, this is an inequity situation. It's unequal wealth. And we're distracted fighting amongst ourselves of white privilege, black, whatever color people we are. When climate change comes and gets us, it doesn't matter what we look like. And I think Mirabai said it right. She doesn't have to apologize for anything. I love what she said. It was honest, it was true, it was pure. And it's right on. Thank you so much. I think we need to get down to the city's business. I read the resolution, it looks fine, sign off on it. If we're gonna do reparations, great. Let's do a resolution for reparations. I support it 100%. The, the wealth inequity in this country could easily cover it billions of times over. 
Thank you, Lynn. All right, with that, seeing no other speakers, we'll close the public hearing and bring this back to council. Um, <clears throat> any questions that were brought up? I have a few things that I caught, um, but I'll let someone else start. Sam. There you go. So I wanna thank all the speakers that came out tonight. I just, I wanted to um, address um, particularly Anna Segur's um, um, speech in Spanish. Um, I, I won't do it in Spanish, but, um, cause I want my um, fellow council members to, um, who didn't understand um, Spanish to be aware of some of the things um, she was asking about. So um, she was just um, asking that we make sure that we reach out to um, the Latino community and um, that we um, make sure what their lives are like and, um, and that we address their concerns, kind of in a nutshell is what she was saying. And I wanted to respond um, just to um, say that there is a lot of stuff going on in the city and if you would like to meet with me, I would be happy to sit down and, um, and chat with you about all of the work that's being done in, in that arena. And um, it's by all means not 100% um, of the way there, but it's a really good start. And I'll just give you some examples. Um, in the 2020 budget, we will um, be hiring a language access person, um, which is something really, really important um, to many of the points that you made that will provide um, some measure of depth in the organization to address non-English speakers. Um, there's also um, a move to look into uh, paying for the staff people that have bilingual skills because oftentimes they get recruited to do extra work that is not compensated. Um, there is a lot of outreach going on in Spanish only. Um, in fact, on Sunday, um, there was um, one that occurred that was very, very much, very successful. And, um, and it was this, the third actually in a series and the effort is to um, do it consistently within the community and come back with follow up on the issues that they bring up. And this is what we were doing on Sunday. Um, and so that's just a few of the things that are going on. Like I said, I'd be happy to sit down with you and chat about it. Um, I also um, wanted to um, address uh, Mr. Feeney's concern about um, the class and race. I will say this, um, because people of color have been um, discriminated against and so much structural racism has been around for so, so long, when you address issues of race, you are addressing issues of class. And I will give you an example. Um, so. Uh, Recently, I was at a presentation by um, a woman by the name of Jordana Barton, and she's a senior advisor for the Federal Reserve Bank. And one of the things that she had done um, was to <coughs> dig into data um, and really looked at the data having to do with access to broadband. And she mapped out this data. And then she did something that I thought was pretty brilliant. She compared it to redlining maps. And lo and behold, they lined up. So the impact of policies that were done long ago are long lasting. And um, to dismantle them will be a long process. And I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg getting started. And um, I think most of us recognize that this resolution is the end, not the end all be all. It's a start. And in fact, the last point in the resolution says that we expect that more resolutions will be coming. So um, I think that's uh, one more thing. A lot of um, people brought up the issue of accountability and I agree that that needs to be a big part of it. And um, the accountability be, will be um, as part of the, um, the plan, the equity plan which is just in its draft form right now, and that's what the working group is working on, is an outreach plan that will go out into the community and, um, and reach deep and find out what the needs are and how the accountability will work out. So 
It's no surprise that the accountability is not in this resolution because we haven't done the outreach to come up with that. Um, that is coming forward and um, in 2020. And I think that's all I have for now. Rachel. Um, thank you to everybody who is here and gave testimony tonight. I, I guess I have a pro process question um, stemming from the timing concerns that were brought up tonight. Uh, we heard a lot of people saying that they would rather us kind of slow down or pause and make sure that we've thought through everything and are understanding everything. So I, I wanted to point out one thing, which is that there were multiple conflicting events tonight, and I think that that, that may have um, taken away the opportunity for some people to be here to present tonight um, in person. We had uh, Steve Fenberg and, and I think maybe Edie Hooten had, had an event tonight that, that drew a lot of people away, and there was also a big impeachment march. So want us to be sensitive to that possibly being a reason to uh, put on some breaks. And then also Anna Seeger's testimony um, made me think that we still have not um, put in place a process for translators here. And so that is um, perhaps depriving some people of being here and having the opportunity to present. And I wonder if we couldn't get, um, if it's possible to get that in place before we decide on this resolution. Um, and then third on accountability, um, I understand we can't get the full um, full measures in until we have community engagement, but can we have some teeth in the resolution that gives uh, the community some assurance that at least we're gonna do the mandatory training and we are committing to a, a deeper level of work. So um, I, I, I guess I'm just wondering process-wise, are we in a hurry to decide this tonight? Can this be a second hearing and we can regroup around it whenever that's appropriate and, and not feel rushed? Aaron. Yeah, thanks as well to everyone who came and spoke to us. I really appreciate your time and your words. Um, you, Rich, I wanted to pick up on a couple of those specifics as I was thinking about them as well. Uh, which was uh, to state in the, the resolution that uh, that the trainings would be uh, we would commit to those being required for members of city council that would make that we would make that commitment to attend those um, and it be an expectation and that in terms of the accountability um, I understand people's uh, desire to look for that this this resolution is a step on a, in a long journey and um, so, but I, I was thinking that we could um, potentially include language um, about developing um, uh, metrics, you know, developing metrics and then reporting them back to the community on a regular basis. Because right now we, it, we have a statement in there about shared accountability, um, but I think we could uh, insert language in there about a, a commitment to, um, to being accountable to the community and, and developing some specific metrics or, around that. Um, I'd, I guess I'd, I'm, I'm fine moving forward tonight because I feel like, again, this is, this is a step and it's a, expressing council's intentions um, to do the work going forward and to work with the community going forward. And the, the plan, the racial equity plan, I think is really where the action happens. And you know, there's a draft version of it in here. There's a lot of great stuff in there, but that's I think where we really need to work with the community to develop the real specific steps um, about what is it exactly that we're going to do. And so, I, I, the way I think about it is that it, you know, potentially tonight, that we as a council express our clear intention uh, to take a step um, and to also then work with the community on developing. Um, the very specific next steps that we would engage in. Okay, Adam. Yeah, first I had a question for city staff in regards to the third party audit uh, question that came up. Mm -hmm. Is that an easily potential option? We no. can ask with our care partners to see who's done it. She'd mentioned Portland. We have a very strong relationship with Portland, so we can definitely check and see what that entails. Because I think that is the best route we, to go. 
We do have a staff team who's working on creating um, a departmental assessment so departments can create do their own assessment of where they are in the racial equity space and what um, what actions they need to take so they can create their own racial equity plans that would roll up to the city's racial equity plan. So in the racial equity plan outline that was in your packets, one of the action items is for departments to, well, one, to create this assessment, have departments implement the assessment, and then incorporate those, um, those outcomes, um, action items into their own racial equity plans. So the way we've been approaching it currently was not a third party auditor, but we can certainly look in to see what that entails and the costs of that. Yeah, I just think that might be helpful in the long term to make sure. Cool. We're not just judging ourselves. I did uh, want to also add that the GARE member meeting this year is in Portland, so we're going to have a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. to spend with our Portland colleagues, so it'll be good. And my other comment was for council, I do think if we can put something um, regarding mandatory training, I think that's a super important part of this. Anything mm -hmm. else? So, I have a response to that in that it says here that we commit to ongoing race relations training, including being among the first groups along with other city boards and commission to be trained in the bias and microaggression training as soon as possible, as well as to participate in advancing racial equity, the role of government. Um, some of us have already been through that, that second module, but it seems to me like by voting for this, you are committing, each council member who raises their hand to vote for this is committing to going to those trainings. And the accountability can come from people asking us, have you done your work or not? So I, I don't know what more we can do than say we commit to this when we raise our hand. I mean, we can be fired by the voters and that's about it. So I'm just referencing in two years when a new council member comes on, Sure, and that's a really good point, actually, is how we refresh this with new councils. And I think that that is a really interesting point that, you know, if we start with this, then maybe each council should recommit to when they come on to this resolution. And maybe we can even sign it so that we have our names as accountable. So, Rachel? Um, I just wouldn't, if we're gonna do it that way, I would not put the onus on voters to, to ask us whether we went to training. I, I think that that should be um, publicly available and, and disseminated, you know, after, right after we go. And I, I, um, I don't know what kind of teeth we can put into mandatory training. I know that when I ran for council, I had to sign that I was willing to do, I was willing to take this job if um, voted in, and maybe that needs to be, you know, you're not sworn in until you've done the training. Like, if we're gonna have this, resolution, it should have some, some meaningful teeth that the voters can rely on. I think the reporting idea is quite good. I mean, I think that is a way of us providing the information so that people can see it rather than them asking for it. And uh, one of the, Rachel, would you be okay if um, it started by on the, um, the racial equity uh, web page um, on the city's website to have um, by council member what they've completed? so that that can be one way that people can access that um, and certainly open to other ways to communicate that to the public because that's not the only way that people receive, receive information, so. That was a question, right? Is it? That was a question. Okay. <laughs> right, Mark. I just want to say a couple words, both in support of uh, what Sam has said and what Aaron has said. Um, to me, it's not a perfect resolution but it is a step, it's a good step, and it, it contemplates many more steps to come, and I would not make perfection be the enemy of the good here. I think it's, a, it's, it's something we ought to do, and we ought to do it promptly, um, and there's a lot more work to be done, and I have every confidence that staff and everybody else will do that work. Um, so I would not delay, uh, I'd be more than happy to consider that resolution tonight. Um, go ahead, Bob, you haven't spoken yet. Yeah, I just wanted to um, go to the uh, sexual orientation point if, if, we're, if we're done with the, the training. We, are we ready to move on? Um, so um, I'm, I'm looking at the version that's actually on 
that's public, so I'm assuming that's the one we're, we're all talking about. Uh, and it does say um, sexual preference, not sexual orientation. That's I don't know if I anybody see. has a version that says orientation. So I, I, whoever makes the motion on this, if that's where we're going, I think two changes. First of all, there's a type, I'm, I'm, I'm in paragraph one, after, the, after all the whereas's and all that. Um, paragraph one, um, we need to close the parentheses, Amy, after, mm -hmm. Amy, are you, Well, I, I call them whereas's because I'm a lawyer. Um, <laughs> yeah. after, after the lettered ones. Yes. Okay, if you go to the numbered paragraphs. Thank you. Paragraph number one. Commits to the inclusivity resolution, paren, resolution number 1178. We need to close the parentheses, if that's where you intended to close it. Okay. And, and never closes. I, I guess that's probably where you want to close it. Okay. And then in the next line, we're, or two lines down, where it says sexual preference. I think we should say sexual orientation. That implicitly not only well, it does it here, but also implicitly corrects resolution 1178, I think. Does that? Well, it's implicit. Well, I mean, I mean, if one, I mean, if we all want to add another paragraph that says, and, and by the way, we also amend resolution 1178. Tom, you can draft that for us if you want to, if people want to go there. Well, I would just do it as part of the motion, Rob. Motion yeah. to adopt this and amend 1178 to change all references to, to sexual preference. Sure. Sexual orientation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Is that what you got? Yeah, I was just trying to yeah. put them out. Put one out. Mm -hmm. All right, this addresses one other thing that came up. Um, when it comes to the racial equity subcommittee that now five of us are on, you know, several people spoke about looking at the sanctuary city status as part of this. So is that a natural place where that can kind of roll in? Mary, I would look to you since you've been the member on it. Well, that's, I would want to um, discuss that at the guiding coalition meeting. Maybe okay. we can add that as an agenda item. And I just it's wanted to tag days. on to that, that we've gotten some emails from folks around this executive order 13888, which is the refugee resettlement and what actions a city has to take to be able to accept refugees. And we learned yesterday morning that it just requires a letter from the city. So another thing I would put out there and bookmark is maybe at the end under matters, we can come back but that would be an action that we can take that's speaking pretty immediately to this issue of refugees. And there's other sanctuary city issues, but that's one that we can move on right away. Um, I had one other point. I found the critique of the first line to be compelling um, that one of the folks who spoke to us brought up. Um, and so I would suggest a small amendment says the Boulder community has long benefited and continues to benefit from the be beautiful natural surroundings that were home to the Southern Arapaho, Cheyenne, and several other tribes. So it's just to add those four words. Sorry, which four words did you want to add? Um, I'll read it again. The Boulder community has long benefited, here's what gets added, and continues to benefit from the beautiful natural surroundings and so on. So it's just being responsive to the point they made that it's ongoing right now. It's not just in the past. I have a counter suggestion. Okay, sure. Um, instead of your change to change um, originally, um, change originally to, were originally to, are the stolen home of the Southern Arapaho Cheyenne. That's just fine. Either one gets it into the present. Or is the stolen home yeah. some, something to that effect? Get the grammar correct. Mm -hmm. Rachel. Protocol question here. Are we putting out all of our concerns and, and comments at this point? We're not just on questions. True? Yeah, yeah, okay. we're, we're in discussion. Uh, okay, good. Um, so on page 112, we talk about, I think the census council acknowledges community values will bump up against each other and hard work will be needed to ensure meaningful decisions are made. Um, I don't know what meaningful decisions mean. I'm not sure if we're committing to giving preference to racial equity as a lens still. Um, and I don't know how it will prevail if we don't prioritize it because historically it, it has not. 
Um, and as an example, uh, OSBT, I've heard the trustees say that their purview is specifically not the health and safety of humans. And so, uh, again, I'm just concerned that this resolution could, um, could be toothless if we're not really committing to um, the, the gravity of the changes that will be required. And so I'm not sure how this will all mesh given that the city is sort of siloed in some ways and, and I don't understand from the resolution how we're going to coordinate those different silos. As an example, again with OSBT, their purview is very different than what a racial equity or, or an anti-racism lens would do. And, and so I think what I'm hearing from the community is don't commit to, to lip service and make sure that you're giving something that, that lets us know that, that you're serious and committed. And, and um, again, we'll just raise my concern that I don't know that we gave the community a, enough time to uh, give feedback and weigh in. So I, I'm still unclear on why, why tonight has to be the night. I would ask to Mary, had the community had enough time, are, are the concerns so, by Rachel valid? This is um, this is a, um, a resolution that has been in the works for quite a while. It is a council resolution. Resolution. It is this council's commitment to this work, um, and it recognizes that um, the accountability is coming in the form of the racial equity plan. It also recognizes that there will be more resolutions coming forth. Um, and the other thing I would add is that the community is welcome to write a resolution as well um, that commits the community. We're not committing the community to this work. We are committing ourselves to this work, um, the nine of us here. Um, I know that city staff has already committed to the work and um, there are a, just a myriad of structural um, changes that are being made in the form of embedding um, the look at policies and programs through this lens. And, um, and so that, that I think um, is where we're at. And I do think that this, this resolution is our resolution. And um, we've gotten the feedback um, just as we got some emails that were saying, um, don't pass it tonight we were getting emails that said, this is um, a great plan, go ahead and pass it. And, um, and that came from some members of um, the working group that is planning um, the outreach for the draft equity plan, as well as the Human Relations Commission. And in fact, the Human Relations Commission back in, I believe it was October, had said that we don't need to review this. This is council's resolution. So um, it is our, it, it is the council's resolution um, and um, the work of the community is something that um, will happen and there will be opportunities for the community to come together around this, but um, that's a part um, I realize it's an extension, but it is um, apart from what we are committing to here tonight. Yeah. yeah, and I feel very much the same way Mary does about this in that we have adopted this or will adopt this for our own body here. Um, I agree that there are lots of things we need community input on and some we have already gotten community input on we had the members of the working group tell us two weeks ago when we first brought this forward just to show to the community and invite public comment that we shouldn't wait at all, that we should adopt it that very day. And so we tried to strike a balance here between having a few weeks with it out where people could see and comment and get the sense of what it, what it is, but this is our promise <clears throat> to the community. And so that's, and I agree with Mary, I think it would be quite interesting if community members generated their own proposed resolution that community members could also sign on to. I just wanted to add, you know, this discussion is very inspiring. Just having the community come here and talk 
But again, progress is about moving forward. And yes, there are community members who find it problematic and want changes, but that's with everything in life. You, we always gonna, there's always gonna be a gap somewhere. So we have to close the gap, but we also have to move forward. You know, just hearing from the Human Relations C Commission and also hearing from the chamber, it says a lot that our community wants changes and we are going at it. But of course, seeing the gaps and also holding us to account is very important. So yeah, I think tonight would be a great night to move forward and in the future, come and hold us to account and ask us to make more changes. And I think that's one of the things that was mentioned that once this resolution passed, it's not just the end, we will come with the meat. So the resolution, it's like the skeleton from my understanding. So I'm willing to move forward because that's what the future requires because sometimes we do talk a lot but not put a lot of actions behind what we say. So this is the opportunity to show that we have a skeleton and we will keep working at it. Thanks. All right. So with that, I will move um, to adopt resolution 1275, committing the city of Boulder to promote racial equity and city relationships, programs, services, services and policies. Um, with um, amendments um, to change references to um, sexual preference, to sexual orientation, and to um, change the language from um, was the home of the Southern Arapaho to the stolen home, something with the correct grammar. Um, and um, I think those were the changes. Mm -hmm. Second. So Ma Mary, could you yes. also add to amend or, uh, resolution 1178 to change sexual preference to sexual orientation? And what Tom said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Before you. we vote, Sam, um, one question. Okay, well, I was going to, Aaron, you accept that um, change from Tom? Yeah, I, I had a, one or two other little things, but Adam, do you want to go ahead? Sure. The mandatory part, where did we ever land on that? Uh, show it on the website, I think, was the first step. S no, the, S oh, go ahead. Well, I just had, the, I was going to make a suggestion around that, the, that in um, item number seven of the of what we're resolving, um, it has A, B, C, D about uh, what the uh, plan would include. And uh, I was thinking about adding one that would in include um, metrics on progress that would be reported back regularly to the community, including council attendance at all trainings. Okay, that'd be good. Is that, Mary, would that work for you? Mm -hmm. Well, can you repeat that, Aaron? Oh, I lost now, I only said. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I really did. Can so, the well, yeah, so, um, Metrics on um, progress uh, that would uh, that would be reported back to the community, uh, including uh, council attendance at trainings. But Rachel, you had a thought. Just a question: Is there any timeline, like an, an end point, when this council needs to do that training, or an expectation? Even I know a lot of you have already done it. Some of us have not. Amy? So the next session that we have scheduled for council to participate is February 7th in the Advancing Racial Equity Rule of Government Training. We're going to be discussing at the end of January um, with the Guiding Coalition the right use of power training, and so that will determine what that timeline looks like. And as far as the bias and microaggression training, that will likely start mid-year because we just went under contract and there's a lot of gearing up to do for that. The only comment I'd make on this is, is um, several council members, of course, do have day jobs, and I want to make sure that as these things are offered, they're offered at multiple times. I wouldn't want a situation where someone was called out for not attending a training simply because they were at work. Right. We have 30 sessions scheduled in January, February, and March for advancing racial equity, the role of government. Right. Um, that being said, they are during the weekdays, <laughs> but we'll figure it out. Okay. Great. Thanks. But we do have one that on your Friday training schedule. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely echo that, that variety of times. Yeah. Um, I mentioned once before. So yep. yep. Even if it could be during a council meeting, that would be helpful because there are some of us who work seven days a week. So. <coughs> okay. The one other one was just that parentheses correction that Bob noted. Oh, yeah. Anything else from anyone in discussion? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is this show of hands? 
all in favor of moving ahead with this equity resolution, raise your hand. It is unanimous. Any members want to make final statements or anything? Thank you all for coming out. Well, oh, Aaron. I just said, we have a lot of work left to do. The, this is one, one step, and we, um, I think we're committing to do the work, but we have a lot, a lot left. I think we all acknowledge that. The structural and systemic racism that our government has been a part of for many decades is not going away quickly, but we're gonna work on it. Very good. Sam, when you said moving ahead, you're, you're approving Aaron's motion, uh, Mary's motion is amended by Aaron, right? That was the vote? Yes. 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 With okay. all the amendments. Just being the lawyer. Just yeah, good. <laughs> the, the record. Keep up there. You approved it. Okay. Your Thanks next public the... hearing is. Thank you, Amy. Yes, thank you so much, Amy. Second reading of Ordinance 8367, designating 2326 Goss Street as an individual landmark. I'll go in. Check. I think we're doing pretty good. We've got two more public hearings. Right. We didn't do the call ups. <coughs> These are five minutes and 30 minutes. This one will take 30, 30 minutes, this will take less than 10 minutes. Pull up the so if we do 30 here, 45 here, like we've said, we're at 10 o'clock. I'll get it. 10, 10 o'clock, yep. <clears throat> so we're out by 10 30 or so. Hi, um, it's time for James Hewitt. I'm not sure you've met James before, but he is our historic preservation planner and he will present this item, James. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having me here this evening. I am James Hewitt, senior historic preservation planner with the city of Boulder. And um, what I'm bringing to you tonight is uh, the second reading of an ordinance for the designation of the house at 2326 Goss Street. And this is uh, a landmark for an individual property. Um, so what we generally do is walk you through the quasi-judicial um, hearing procedure because this is a public hearing. Um, would you like me just to run through this very briefly? Okay. Yes. Um, because it is quasi-judicial and it is a public hearing, um, everyone uh, that's speaking needs to be sworn in. The city council members should note any ex parte contacts they may have had about this project. I'll make a brief presentation. The owner will then um, have the opportunity to do the same. The public hearing is open for citizen comment and the owner can respond to any of the comments that were made during the public hearing. Um, the public hearing is closed and you as the city council um, will discuss and a motion requires an affirmative vote of at least five to pass the motion to designate or uh, alternately to deny the, the ordinance this evening. So with, the, with that, um, Mayor Weaver, I don't, I don't know if you'd like to ask her. So asking for ex parte? So has anyone had any ex parte communication, meaning communication directly about the project we're about to listen no. to. And I'll check with the two when they come back. Okay, and then swearing in. Um, anyone speaking to this item? Um, I, I thought we changed that rule to not require swearing in. We did, project. we don't swear people in we, any oh. longer. Oh, we don't, okay. No. Oh, we do at the Landmarks Board, so. Yeah. Okay, good. Planning Board doesn't. All right. So we decide. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go right into it then. <clears throat> um, so you have three choices this evening to, uh, to approve the designation um, by ordinance, to modify and approve the ordinance, or to disapprove the designation. And that's 9116 of the Boulder Revised Code. And, um, that refers to 9-11-1 and 9-11-2 of the Boulder Revised Code, which is really the purpose of the Historic Preservation Ordinance, which is to protect, enhance, and perpetuate buildings, sites, and areas reminiscent of past events, persons um, important in local, state, or national history. Um, secondly, it's to maintain appropriate settings, to enhance property values, 
stabilize neighborhoods, promote tourist trade, and foster knowledge of the city's living heritage. And finally, um, the ordinance uh, talks about drawing a reasonable balance between private property rights and the public interest in preserving the city's heritage. So that needs to be carefully weighed with the public good and, and the private property, obviously. So in terms of location, um, we're talking about a property that's in what is known as the Goss Grove neighborhood, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, it is that part of town which historically was where the working class folks um, lived in Boulder. And actually, the little inset map um, on the left shows a green area which um, was surveyed in 1986 and identified as the Goss Grove Potential Historic District um, and is referred to as the little rectangle sometimes. And that was historically the African American um, <coughs> neighborhood in Boulder. Uh, it wasn't all African American, but it tended to be the place where African Americans lived um, when they came to Boulder in the early years, uh, during early settlement. But it was also a place where immigrants from all over um, settled in Boulder, sort of a transitional neighborhood. And during the post-World War II era, it changed from being a primarily African-American neighborhood to being more of a Latino neighborhood. So it's transitioned over the years and then during the, the 70s um, became more of a rental neighborhood, which is really the character that it is now. And the reason I say that is while this isn't part of that little rectangle or Goss Grove neighborhood, it's adjacent to it and certainly some of the patterns that uh, occurred there in the development are consistent with that neighborhood. <coughs> So just by way of background, this came in for review through the Historic Preservation Program um, just a little more than a year now ago in December, uh, December 6th when a demolition application was submitted and um, th the Design Review Committee uh, referred the case to the Full Landmarks Board. Now the Design Review Committee is a subcommittee of the uh, Full Landmarks Board and they review demolitions of buildings that are older than 50 years that were constructed before 1940. So they referred it to the full Landmarks Board who um, reviewed the application in February of 2019 and they voted to, to place a, a 5-0, they voted to place a stay of demolition on the application for a period of up to 180 days. And the purpose of that um, stay of demolition is to explore alternatives to the removal of the building. So that occurred and there were several meetings that occurred with um, um, Mr. Garcia, the property owner, looking at alternatives to the demolition, uh, one of which was could that building be kept and the property redeveloped, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, later. So um, at the end of the, the stay, of, uh, stay of demolition, the Landmarks Board did hold an initiation hearing, which they sometimes do if they think a property is of historic significance. And they did that on Ju June 5th, uh, 2019. Um, that is to hear the application to designate the property, which they reviewed on October 2nd of this year. Now the vote was three to two. So two of the Landmarks Board uh, members voted against the designation. One of them felt that <clears throat> some of the changes that had occurred to the building um, altered it enough that they didn't think it was historic and um, the other uh, board member felt that it might affect um, the intensity of development on the property. That is that it, it might not, if it was designated, um, be allowed to have as many units in there. So, um, uh, during the, the course of these reviews, four members of the public have spoken in support of the building's preservation. Three members have spoken in support of demolition. And alternatives were discussed, including raising the house, because it is in an area of Boulder that's in the 100-year flood zone. And uh, certainly during floods in the past, that area has been inundated. So uh, the house would need to be raised out of the floodplain. It's not very much, it's about a foot. 
Um, <clears throat> and then it was also discussed that the house could perhaps be moved forward on the lot and then um, a new unit or units built at the rear of the property. And so in that scenario, both of those scenarios, rehabilitation and incorporation of the house um, was discussed in sort of the larger re redevelopment of the property. Now the owner, um, it says up there that he's opposed to landmark designation and I think through the process of the stay of demolition and the initiation, he has expressed um, his preference that it not be landmarked. But during subsequent um, conversations, he's revealed that he, if he could develop the property as he wants, um, he wouldn't be necessarily be against landmark designation, but I'll let Mr. Garcia speak to that um, a little bit later. So just in terms of the house, this is um, a pretty old house. It was built in the 1890s. And as you can see, it's a pretty simple house on the top. That's a photograph um, from about 1949. That's a tax assessor photograph of the house. Um, it's um, <coughs> really pretty well preserved. Architecturally, it's an example of vernacular house, uh, uh, of a vernacular, vernacular house, a house really which was for the working class and of the working class in Boulder. It's largely intact with the exception of the reconfiguration of the porch roof, um, which I'll show you in um, the next slide. And the application of vinyl siding, it looks as though the old siding is underneath, so it would probably be quite simple to take that off. And environmentally, the property retains the residential character of the area. That area has been changed somewhat. There are quite a few large apartment buildings there, but it is a remnant of that residential past. So what we um, try and look at and consider when we're looking at a historic building is the historic integrity. That is, how much does the building speak to its past and, and how much does it reflect that past? One of the um, examples that's given is if um, the original owner of the house were to visit it today, would they recognize the house? And I think in this case, you would probably say that, yes, it's, it's really um, pretty intact in terms of the form of the house. Um, it has the very simple porch on it, pedimented front, and then this large hipped roof, which was really um, very indicative of, of these kind of four room houses that were built in the late 19th century in Boulder. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that the Landmarks Board and the applicant and we as staff discussed was the removal of the garage and the accessory buildings at the back, which would provide for redevelopment of the site um, if it were to be landmarked. So one of the um, understandings is that that garage that you can see on the top right, which extends to the back, and you can see the shed additions that are on that building on the bottom left, um, could be removed to make way for new construction on the property. So again, 9-11-1 um, asks the question, essentially, would the designation protect, enhance, and perpetuate a building and property reminiscent of a past era? Um, and I think this house clearly is um, eligible in terms of it, uh, its architecture, its um, relationship to the property, um, and does it draw a reasonable balance between private property rights and the public interest? Staff did recommend um, and is still recommending that um, the city council designate this property because it does seem like it's really quite feasible to keep the building, economically feasible and physically feasible to do that and uh, redevelop the property under the current zoning, which is RH2. So um, as we generally do, we recommend, um, and the Landmarks Board does as well, recommend that the whole property, which is about 5,800 square feet, be designated. Um, and you can see in the dotted line, that would be the portion of the building that would be considered historically and architecturally significant and should be protected. And then the other buildings on, or other portions of building on the property could be, um, removed through the landmark alteration certificate review process and new construction reviewed also through that process if it were to be landmarked. 
So again, just showing some photographs of the, the shed buildings that would come off um, in, that, uh, in that scenario. So um, staff does recommend, and the Landmarks Board too, recommends that the um, City Council designate this property and um, allowing for redevelopment on the property and keeping this relic, um, remnant of the past, um, on Goss Street um, for future generations. And with that, I will conclude. I, uh, Fran Sheets is here, the chair of the Landmarks Board, if you have any questions of her. And um, Mr. Garcia is here as well. So if you have any questions, I am available to answer any of them. Council, any questions? Okay, start with Aaron. So Aaron and Rachel, can I just ask you, before you begin, you were both out of the room. Have you, either of you had any ex parte conversations about this? None whatsoever. Okay. No. Great, perfect, go ahead. I think Mark raised his hand first. No, no, right before. Um, so uh, James, thank you for the presentation. The, uh, in, in here it says that, that the um, non-contributing structures, right, the garage and the shed, uh, uh, could be removed. Yes. It, it was what I was reading it, but I didn't see, it, it in fact, and I, I lost it now, but I did, somewhere in the packet it said the ordinance will allow them to be removed or something like that, but the, I didn't see anything in the ordinance that spoke to the status of the garage and the shed. I think what the memo refers to is that those portions of the building would be defined as non-contributing or non-historic. <clears throat> that could be reflected in the ordinance. Um, it's, it's actually not. We usually don't put things in that we think are not, we, but we identify those aspects of the building that are historically important. So the shed and the garage are not mentioned as being character-defining features. I, it, I just, what I'm wondering is like what sort of guarantee does, if the proper owner comes back and says, well, I'd, I'd like to remove those, what, what guarantee would they have that they would be able to remove them? Well, none in terms of what's listed in the ordinance, but certainly in terms of the discussions that have taken place um, over the past year, you know, I think that the, the Landmarks Board would be um, open to, to those, the removal of those, and they made that very clear in their deliberations. Okay, thank you. One other question, can you go back a slide? Sure. The, or two, to, I guess to the map, the, land, the landmark boundary. How are many slides back there? <laughs> Seems to be a little stuck here. There we go. There we go, sorry. That one. Okay, so, um, so the recommendation is that the that it be the whole lot be the landmark boundary, and then you've kind of sketched out the the house in <coughs> blue, but that's sort of sort of an <coughs> FYI sketch out, right? There's nothing. No, that's not part of the ordinance. Yeah, so the the whole lot would be what would be what you're recommending, but there there's there's nothing again calling out the house specially. Uh, if I could, uh, Councilmember Rocket, I mean, I, you are correct that the ordinance does not specifically make a distinction between the house and the garage and the shed building. Um, the motion in front of you is um, essentially um, the, uh, the motion that was approved by the Landmarks Board, and what they did in their motion was refer to the, the property as described in the memo that was in front of them. In your packet, it's page 186 of the packet, is the memo that was uh, in front of the Landmarks Board, and it does, it includes that same map and also includes language <coughs> distinguishing the status of the house from that of the garage and the attached shed to it. So while it's not in the ordinance that's in front of you, it, uh, the, the Landmarks Board in its recommendation to you was explicit in terms of distinguishing the status of the house from that of the garage and the shed. Okay, we'll come back to it in dis discussion. It just seems a couple levels removed from, so, but we can talk about it later. That, that's good enough for me, thank you. Uh, I guess I'll just sorry. piggyback on, oh, sorry. That's my mistake. Sorry. Always happy to wait. Um, well, piggybacking though on, on what Aaron said, as a property owner, I would certainly feel better if, if 
what was landmarked was what I was, what was actually landmarked and not buildable. So I'm a little bit confused by that boundary and, and why it's not cleaner and why we would want to build in extra steps and, and concern for the property owner. Um, but also wanted to ask, it was a three to two, so kind of a close vote at the landmark, landmarks board. And I wanted to make sure I understood the second dissenting vote. It was that they, it, it might negatively impact density if we landmarked it because otherwise it could it could house more people. Is that accurate? That that was yeah. That's that's what John Decker expressed. Um, that his his understanding was that it might affect um, the density that could occur under the RH two zoning. Um, and I'm sorry if it's in the memo and I'm not recalling it, but but. Uh, what is the density in the, you know, kind of on that block or the neighboring units? Well, <clears throat> um, I'm not an expert on um, the zoning districts, but RH2 generally allows for on an average sized lot um, two dwelling units. Okay. By right. Thanks. Adam. Uh, well, sorry, I, <laughs> Mark's turn. I'll Please, Mark. Turn back. Okay. I have a couple of questions. Um, how many examples of the uh, vernacular architectural style are there in Boulder? What's the uniqueness of this? The uniqueness of it? Mm -hmm. um, well, I wouldn't say it's necessarily unique in terms of it being a, um, a vernacular building, but it's certainly a good representative example of a vernacular building. And, and how many similar styles would you say uh, exist in the, in the Gosgrove neighborhood? Um, of this type, I would say there's a handful left, I, a half a dozen perhaps. It's and certainly a vanishing, <laughs> it's, a, it's a vanishing um, type of building. And, uh, and it's not really a style per se, you know, it's, it's, it, that's sort of what defines it. It's, it's more of a form, it's more of a, an unadorned um, type of architecture. And it's currently vinyl sided, if, if we, uh, approve the designation, will either the current or future owners be required to remove the vinyl siding? Not necessarily, no. Then how are we going to be uh, evidencing its, its character? Um, well, I, I would argue that it still uh, certainly exhibits its character. I, I don't think that the vinyl siding would, um, you know, in, in a major way affect the, the architectural sort of elements of that building. And the, actually the, the wood siding is underneath, the original wood siding is underneath, so it would actually be quite simple to take it off. But nobody will be required to do that. No one would be required okay. to, um, no. And is there a specific understanding uh, as to what can be developed on the balance of the, the property, which seems rather small? I mean, are we talking about an ADU? Are we talking about a two-family <coughs> building? What, what are the potential? Well, I think that uh, uh, p potentially, the, the lot could accommodate two dwelling units. Two additional. RH2. No, two in total. Two in total. Yep. Okay. And that's whether it's landmarked or not. That, that wouldn't necessarily affect it if it were landmarked. Um, okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay. Anyone else? So, I may have missed this in the... <coughs> um, Memo, I, I'm trying to catch up on, on the history. Can you mention briefly the historical significance? Because that's a criteria that we're supposed yeah, to. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, let me go back. Um, it's, it's associated with the Jorats and the Bader families. And um, the, uh, the Jorats were early settlers. Um, Mr. Jorats was born in Marshall um, in the 1880s and um, they bought the house in 1910. It was built around 1895. We're not exactly sure of the, the, the exact date. Um, so yeah, he was, um, he sold it to his brother, um, Mr. Joratz, and, and they actually um, ran a, a blacksmithing shop on the 1100 block of um, Walnut Street for many years. Uh, and they also um, ran a liquor store. So they were local merchants and um, well-known in the community. 
And then later it was, um, it was sold to uh, the Baders, and John Bader was a pilot um, and uh, piloted uh, B-24s in World War II. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, public hearing now. Um, actually, the app, the app, uh, so the applicant, the uh, right. property owner has property an opportunity to, to speak. Hi there, Rodrigo Garcia. We already discussed for many, many hours of all this process. So, yeah, there is vinyl siding, and I want to mention that I did own 1915, 1921, 1935, and 1921 Goss, which is the block of the African-American block, and, and we went through those discussions too, and, and those houses did have, in my opinion, the significance to designated as a landmark, and so I will draw my, my demolition application, but in this case, in this house, I couldn't find in this house the potential of this landmark. Mainly is, first of all, the house is in the flood plan, so it have to be elevated, take it out of the flood plan, no matter what, landmark or no landmark, I have to get this house elevated off, and there are elements of the, uh, the, the energy efficiency of the house as it is right now. That is really in, in really bad condition, 1920 house that has a vinyl siding and a stereophone glued to the original siding of the house. So I'm a developer, so I want to develop this property and uh, the landmark designation, it will not stop the development because by right, the questions you ask, can we develop these houses? I can add a 1,200 square foot dwelling unit which have to be attached to this house and this is what the, the code is. And the other things that I want to make sure is in the in the question is if the house mark as a landmark, not the garage. So if this pass or no pass, next day I will go to the city building department and require the demolition of the garage and the shed that is from the fifties. And the city will say, we'll have to go to Landmark. We'll go to Landmark, and Landmark were already authorized that that was already passed to the city council. So that's, even though I have to go back to the process of the Landmark, the discussion has been done. So that's pretty much it. If you guys have any questions, I, I can answer. Yes. Um, are you saying that there are, are other homes on that block that, that are now Landmarked that you own? No. Or there, no, okay. No, I will draw the, I will draw the demolition a permit when we discussed on the first, what was the value of the African Americans living in those houses and the architecture, and I was, well, that, it makes sense. So actually, those houses are not to be demo. They were being remodeled for the inside, all of them, brand new, but still exactly as it was. But in this case, I did want to go through the process, which is a year now into the process, because I didn't uh, see that this was one of those. But anyway, which, uh, we have a kind of an agreement. It's, uh, it's the development is going to happen with the landmark or no landmark. If it's no landmark, I can demo the entire house and build something else and the second dwelling unit. If it's landmark, I need to raise it, make it efficient, energy efficient, and then in the back I can build 1,200 square foot. Mark, I'm just a little confused. Yes. Are, are you so in effect you are consenting to the landmark designation? with the demolition of the garage and- And the shed on the back. Okay, that makes life a lot easier. Yes. So I have another question. <clears throat> I thought I heard that you had to attach the second dwelling unit to the to the historic home. Correct. Is that, why is that? It's part of the, the code, the city of Boulder, which the dwelling units needs to be attached. It has to do with parking requirements and things like that. Attached means, you know, one portion or through a, through a covered area, they need to be attached. So it could be a covered area. It could be a covered area. I see, okay. Yes. Aaron? <coughs> Thanks for talking to us, Mr. Garcia. Um, so if we change the landmark boundary to only include the house itself and not the back half of the lot, does that make, make your life easier? That's what the only way that you make my life easier. <laughs> <laughs> if you designate the entire lot and then we start discussions about the shed building 19, you saw the pictures, put the mm -hmm. pictures one more time. 
and the garage, which is uh, collapsing, and it's, it's, it's nothing historical into it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's then we're going to be another year discussing, in, in, you know, a metal roof garage that is collapsing, and yeah, I mean, you take a picture of the sheds in the back. It's just yep. my so daughter can build that. Understood. So why is it, James? This is just for you. Yeah. Why is it that? Um, <clears throat> You wanted to designate the entire lot. Is it because Heidi, of an could address? You the, could you put the slide back on? Just um, we could take a look at this again. Um, you know, typically th we do that. We we do the mm -hmm. whole property, not just the building. And and the reason for that is that um, you know at some point you could perhaps build in front of the building or do something that might really um, in the future uh, be to the detriment of the historic building so it's it's really about context yeah and we've seen that before the last landmarks case we looked at had something just like that so would it be possible to z designate the front part of the lot all the way to the rear of the house oh sure yeah because that way it removes the question of the shed and removes that additional process but it captures the yard and the home itself and we have done that in the past where we've done a sort of a view shed from the right of way and then, uh, you know, the, the new construction would not um, be subject to review through, through a, a, the landmark alteration certificate process. Okay, and if we were to decide as council to do that, um, would it need to go back to landmarks for their comments? I, I don't think so. I think that probably could be yeah, amended could here. Yeah, I think it's consistent with landmarks recommendation. Yeah. So what you do, need to do is amend section six of the ordinance to just insert the words a portion of the lots and then a, a substitute the map that's exhibit B with a map that shows only the Ford portion in green and el eliminate the, back, the rear portion. Um, and you could do that. You'd have to bring it back for third reading uh, <sighs> on January 7th, so I don't see that as a problem. Another reading? I what thought this was it. What's that? I well, thought this was the last reading. If it's they amend it, they'll have to. Yeah, they can't amend I it. see. But, but that's usually pro forma. We, yeah, we often yeah. make it, the decision. It wouldn't be a public hearing necessarily. They okay. On the yes. consent agenda, it would pass. So it will be just between you, you know, drawing the new, you know, the lot from the front back to the front and, right. and use one more month for you guys just to vote it without probably hearing our discussions about it. Jeannie? Mm -hmm. I just have a quick question about, it may not concern building construction or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, with the his because I live in Gos near Cosgrove, and you know how they have the little placards in, on the homes that say it's a floodplain, but I've mm -hmm. never seen anything like that in any of the homes that say this is a historic home. So I'm wondering, or maybe I missed it. Yeah, you actually um, for all the properties that are individually landmarked, we do provide a a, a bronze plaque. With, okay. a, with just a, sh a short history that um, can be mounted on the house or somewhere else on the property. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anything else you'd like to tell us? No. Okay. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Now public hearing. Great. Um, I'm not in a really good mood about demolition after being up at the 311 property yesterday. Um, and I went to the site and I saw the uh, extension off the back, the, the, what apparently was probably, it looks a little bit like Joe's auto body and repair, which I sent you about, I want to landmark that. Um, it's really long, it's short, it looks like a dwarf could be in there maybe. So. I'd say if you if you could do something if you could do a landmark alteration and and pop that up, um, it might be a little bit narrow, or if you could keep the wall on the um, west side and extend the building out um, on the east, that'd be cool. Um, and then you could connect it to the house. They have a little patio in the back. There's a little, um, what do you call the thing that sticks out, a dormer on the side, that's on the east side of the main house. That, like, I definitely recommend landmarking the, the place. But um, 
I just would like to see that cute little building, which I'm sure you hate, <laughs> the, the drive, you know, the garage kind of thing. It's not really a garage. I don't know what it was, the function was. It, well, I guess it is kind of a garage. You see it from the front as a garage. And that shed on the back, that could be demolished, I think, or deconstructed. Nothing at 311 is being deconstructed. Um, but that's my recommendation, landmarking it. And then you have that space in the front. It's always gonna have to be there. Like, you lift the place up. I mean, that's pretty typical in Goss Grove. You're gonna have to do that. I mean, when you buy that property, you know you've got an issue. Makes sense to me. Landmark it and, and do some alterations on that back building. Save everything we got. Thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> Bring it back to council. No, you should give Mr. Garcia a chance if you, to respond. To respond, okay. If he has any responses to Ms. Siegel. <coughs> Uh, the shed in the back and the garage, they are encouraged on what is the, 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 right, the easements of the property. So they're actually, <coughs> the garage will have to be lifted because also it's on the floor plan. It's not structural safe to be lift. It's not, it's not liftable. That's, that's the reality of the garage. It's, 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 a, it's a sitting on a slab of concrete, doesn't have a basement. And you know, two by four structures with the with the roof and no electrical. It's just it's just not it's not liftable. Nobody uh, that uh, the, the two people that came to take a look in the house, <coughs> they all the garage is like we can't. This is this is not liftable. So, just to say. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'd be happy to move us forward with a motion about change with, that includes changing the property boundary if that's amenable to folks. Sure. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and move um, acceptance of ordinance 8367, um, but to amend um, uh, section six to say that the legal landmark boundary encompasses part of the legal lot upon which it sits with then an amendment to the map in exhibit A to draw the boundary at the southern edge of the main house. Does that work, Tom? Yes, perfect. Second. Any discussion? You wanna to speak to your motion? Well, I'll just say with, with, with that as amended, it seems to strike the sort of balance of uh, public and private property, public interest and private property rights so that you could demolish the non-contributing garage and shed easily, put another dwelling unit on there which the city could use while maintaining some historic ca character and a smaller home that presumably won't be super expensive to live in. Not that that's a criteria, it's just a sort of side benefit. I think Aaron said it really well. Thank you. Yep. And just a reminder, this is a criteria-based decision we're making, so we're making this adjustment to um, strike the balance Aaron spoke about, but this is a quasi-judicial, and so we're interpreting, we're accepting the findings of staff. In this. Yeah, the, those extra couple things I said are just like nice to have, but the criteria is the public and private benefit. Right. Balance. Okay, anyone else? Bill, I just chime in and say something real quickly. I think that um, the, the idea of landmarking a home that belonged to the working class, I think is um, significant in that um, it recognizes that segment of our community. And I think it's important to recognize as well as the big stately homes. Well said. Okay, all right, it's, it, there's no more comments. Why don't we take a vote? Is this roll show of hands? Okay, all in favor of the landmarking as described by Aaron, raise your hands. Unanimous, very good, thank you. Thank you. Your final public hearing for this evening is second reading of ordinance 8370, updating transportation design standards.
Jane, Jane, we can probably start whenever you're ready. Yeah, we're, we're just waiting for this to get pulled up. Okay. So you all know Garrett Slater? Oh, there we go. And Garrett is our principal transportation projects engineer. Good evening. So um, we are here to present the, um, the update to what we're calling the phase one of the design and construction standards. And the reason that uh, I am presenting this for before you tonight is because I uh, coordinate the activities of the capital projects program for the transportation division of the public works department. And the uh, updates that we're bringing forward to you tonight for um, your consideration are pertaining to the transportation design standards. Um, joined, uh, joining me tonight is uh, Bill Cowern, our uh, acting uh, director of transportation, as well as DK Kemp, uh, transportation planner uh, with Go Boulder that's been uh, actively involved and the, uh, the update of these standards, as well as Edward Stafford from Planning and Development Services. And uh, it's important that Edward's here tonight as well because uh, it's his work that actually uh, uses the, um, the DCS as a guiding um, standard and document for the, uh, the standards by which um, public improvements are built uh, for private development. So we use them in terms of uh, public uh, investment and, and improvement and, and his group use them, uses the standards for, for private development. So um, our uh, desire and being before you tonight uh, it stems from a desire to provide some update to some critical sections of the design and construction standards that uh, we've heard feedback from various members of the community, as well as uh, ourselves as practitioners and implementing projects uh, throughout the transportation network. Uh, as well as to uh, bring the DCS into uh, conformance with our recently adopted transportation master plan and the uh, Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And so the changes that uh, are, bring, uh, are here for your consideration uh, uh, consist of uh, various elements in chapter two pertaining to transportation design in terms of site access and transportation facilities. There's uh, more specifics that I'll get to here in a moment, as well as uh, some updates to the technical drawings that pertain to our ADA or Americans with Disabilities Act practices for uh, pedestrian ramps and improving mobility for people of all ages and abilities within the pedestrian uh, network. So this process started at the beginning of 2019 and uh, as noted, we uh, heard from various folks, uh, primarily our uh, partners at Community Cycles about some concerns about uh, making the DCS more compliant with uh, where the, the direction of the TMP was heading. And our uh, counterparts within utilities were also working on an update to the DCS um, so that they could make it compliant with state regulation requirements. And they had a firm deadline of uh, getting the, their DCS updates in place by uh, I believe it was July or end of June of 2019. And our initial desire was for those uh, updates to, uh, to be brought forward jointly. And so we commenced that process working with TAB and identified the process and the, the key areas that we wanted to make some updates for, um, and including intersections, street geometry, lane widths, and right turn bypass I islands. And that work was continuing forward, um, but uh, we were also uh, all uh, moving with forward with the heavy lift that was uh, getting the transportation master plan update um, um, brought forward. And so we ran into a staffing constraint. And so uh, we had to slow down the process of uh, the DCS update and decided to detach it from the utilities update effort. And so um, we uh, were then able to bring forward to TAB a public hearing in September, uh, the consideration of these updates and they, uh, uh, endorsed these uh, uh, updates unanimously. And then at the November planning board meeting, we brought these uh, updates for their consideration and your recommendation as well. And uh, they also unanimously uh, endorsed the, uh, the updates. But uh, planning board um, also provided some friendly amendments to the recommendation that I'd like to address here with this slide. And so the first was uh, a desire to consider recommending the increasing of sidewalk widths from uh, four feet to five feet on residential streets 
And uh, 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 Council Member Brockett uh, raised some questions via the hotline earlier today, or perhaps yesterday. Uh, in any account, uh, uh, Bill Cowan, the uh, Acting Transportation Director, provided a response that spoke to our desire for this to be uh, a phase two work program effort. Um, we are uh, certainly interested in seeing what we can do to make all of our pedestrian infrastructure uh, more friendly and accommodating for uh, uh, users of all ages and abilities. <coughs> um, but uh, we wanna make sure that we fully, and uh, fully um, uh, understand and, and comprehend all the implications of what that might mean. And um, so uh, propose that that be considered in phase two. And uh, then another consideration was uh, the, uh, a, an alternative street design amendment, uh, uh, specifically street shall be designed with due attention to building spacing and setbacks, green spaces, attractive materials, plannings, landscaping, pedestrian safety, utility, multimodal use, walkability, and alternative designs. And so um, I would say that the, uh, the transportation master plan includes a number of policy uh, objectives and goals that are entirely consistent with all of these desires. And because council adopted the transportation master plan as a framework by which we want to implement all of our transportation infrastructure, that uh, it might be somewhat redundant for us to uh, adopt it into to the, to the code. Um, and so our preference would be that we continue to study what we can do to, um, um, uh, to, to incorporate that into the phase two DCS update. And then uh, finally, uh, there was a desire for city council to consider the 20 is plenty movement. And uh, as um, Bill Cowan noted, um, as part of the vision zero action plan for um, 20, um, 20 uh, as well as uh, the neighborhood speed mitigation, that will be an effort that's uh, studied and evaluated as we get into 2020. So just wanted to respond to each of those amendments and um, um, appreciate uh, uh, planning board's uh, thoughtful uh, review of these updates. And so our purpose with you tonight uh, is the second reading and the consideration of a motion to update the, the transportation design standards by amending the, uh, the, the city of Boulder uh, design and construction standards. And um, as I've uh, conveyed to both uh, TAB as well as to planning board, this violates every uh, PowerPoint uh, do not do this uh, <laughs> uh, 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 example I've ever seen uh, because it's uh, laden with text and words. So I have provided it though, just in, in the case you would like to dive into the details of the individual elements of the design standards we're proposing for, for update uh, that we can access it. But you can see it consists of speed change lanes, um, access and curb width, uh, uh, criteria, um, uh, uh, lane widths, uh, uh, I'd like to touch on this briefly. We, we noted this in uh, the response to uh, Council Member Brockett as well as in the memo, that our desire is to make the DCS uh, more consistent with our new vernacular within the, uh, the low stress walk and bike network as well with uh, what, uh, NACTO, for those that don't know what that means, that's the uh, National Association of City Transportation Officials and it's uh, an organization that's much more oriented towards uh, city transportation design because a lot of the standards that we have used to historically are oriented more towards um, big rural highway design and we want to make sure that we're designing in a way that's uh, uh, sensitive to the context of our, uh, our, our city and our urban nature and so that uh, is, is incorporated into this. Um, as well, we've got uh, some updates with respect to multi-use path, on-street bike parking, and uh, street lighting and uh, transit facilities, as well as some upgrades to our, as I noted earlier, our curb ramp uh, revisions for ADA standards. Um, here's a quick recap of the timeline that we've been on over recent months. And um, as noted, um, looking forward into 2020, we'll be initiating the phase two update and um, so our uh, recommendation for you is to uh, adopt Ordinance 8370 as uh, included in your memo. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Great, thank you. Questions from council? Mary. Thanks for that, Garrett. I do have um, a few questions. Um, the, wor the first one has to do um, with the, um, 2.13 um, on um, transit stop design, design practices. And I was wondering if um, in NACTO in, well, they don't have any, is that is that correct? Did I read that correctly, that they don't have much of um, standard in transit stops? So it's, uh, uh, NACTO does include uh, uh, pretty strong guidance with respect to transit stop. Yeah. 
um, uh, implementation and installation. It's our, uh, it's the design and construction standards, which. Oh, okay. Act. Okay, and so I'm wondering if in their um, detailed um, transit stop design practices, they include um, the potential for areas um, to, for snow storage. So say, um, you know, adjacent to the transit stop, there might be a place to put snow, excess snow. Is there anything like that in there? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. I don't, do you know it? <clears throat> Good evening, Council. Dave Kemp, Senior Transportation Planner. And so it's really context sensitive, the design manual. And so, you know, whenever we do a particular project, there is the ability to you know, take a look at um, what space we do have available and then make that consideration when we actually design um, the facility. Is that something that could be considered um, in the, the design standards is to add something that where it's permissible to add a place for snow storage? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. And then, um, let's see, next question is, um, has to do with, curb ramps. Um, I notice when I'm out and about in town that there are some curb ramps, um, especially um, on barrier islands or large intersections that don't have um, the tapers where they fall off um, vertically. And so I'm wondering if, is that to some old standard or um, with these new standards, would that be um, not allowed? So with the, uh, your, with the, the vertical drop off you're describing? Yeah, where there's a, yeah, where there's the, the curb ramp with the little knobbies. Um, right. What are they called? Yeah, yeah, the the the, the, tech, the, the detectable the tech warning panels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but you're, you're describing as you go through the ramp uh, on, on the uh, on the sides, how some have a, a, an adjacent flare and some have a vertical edge. Correct. Right, and, and so our preference is always to, to put the, the tapered flared edge um, where practical, but um, the design and construction standards recognize that um, particularly in um, built out um, really constrained environments, sometimes you don't have the space to do that. Uh -huh. So there will continue to be provision for the, that vertical edge to be present. And, and our interactions, um, uh, we did a, uh, an exercise with um, the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the the local, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on their, their name right now, but the, the, the group were the people with disabilities, um, where we actually, are, we, we brought our staff over and we uh, went through a, an exercise where we were blindfolded and they guided us through uh, so that we could understand what it was like for them. And what we learned from them through that exercise um, is that uh, uh, someone who is visually impaired um, would, um, uh, they were less concerned with um, um, not having the flare because the curb, they said, with a walking stick would communicate to them that they would need to, to be able to carry forward. And they said that, uh, uh, at, at least this is anecdotal, but uh, their, their observation was that more, is more likely to be a problem for um, somebody who's not visually impaired. And, and in a wheelchair, perhaps? Uh, and. And so in a wheelchair, um, right, then the path would be for them to, to uh, there, there's supposed to be um, adequate width in the approach to each one of those ramps mm -hmm. so that there's a, a maneuverability space um, to allow wheelchairs to be able to get in. Um, the primary purpose of having the flare is to, to eliminate a, tri a tripping hazard. Okay, okay. And um, so what I'm hearing is that in the cases where it's vertical, it's due to space constraints. Correct. Okay. Um, and then um, right before 2.12 street lighting, and I, for, I don't know if I can go back to what the section is, but it's talking about um, on-street bike parking um, corrals. And um, it refers to um, placing those in areas um, with high pedestrian volumes. And I was wondering where high pedestrian volumes is defined. I'll let DK speak to that, but you, you might be familiar with the location on West Pearl. Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. uh, an illustrative That's a example. great example. 
So basically, uh, many locations in our downtown where we've got a lot of um, activity on the sidewalks, those would be ideal places to install on-street bike parking corrals. While understanding there is a balance between you know, achieving a certain number of vehicle car parking spaces, we are also trying to look at where we can take some of those bikes off sidewalks and put them on the street. Okay, so it's, um, so high pedestrian volume would be observed pedestrian volume? It's not necessarily some sort of a count on number of people that go by or anything like there's that? There's not a, no, there's, it's, it's not a little more anecdotal in, in saying that this particular area is a commercial, has commercial use and, and there's a lot of people out walking around and whatnot, okay. so. Okay. Yeah, there's not a quantitative. Thanks. All right, thanks, DK. Um, and then that's all I have. Okay, anyone else? Adam. Mary brought this up briefly, but did any of this work include sort of a view with snow removal in mind, since that is such a large recent topic? I'm not sure that uh, snow removal was contemplated as a part of, the, of the, 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 this specific update, but I, I do know that um, uh, I can speak uh, in terms of our general practice and the implementation of capital projects that uh, provision for snow storage is always a consideration. Um, uh, and, and a good example of that would be uh, whenever we uh, do a bridge project, Historically, um, uh, there are a number of bridges uh, around the, the community um, where we would narrow the bridge to save cost, but then what would happen is that meant that the sidewalk was directly adjacent to a travel lane, and then there's no place to store snow. And so our practice now is that we want there to be separation between the travel lane and the, um, and the sidewalk so that we, we have snow storage. And so that's just one small example of how we, we, we work with our uh, counterparts in operations and maintenance to, to provide um, snow storage. That's great. I just think it's important to recognize that as that comes up that we constantly reassert that we're doing stuff for snow removal purposes. Aaron. Thank you. So just to interpret that, the maybe a fair statement to say that this particular update didn't focus on snow removal but that it's integrated throughout these standards. It's, it's always uh, absolutely a, a design factor and a consideration. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Questions, okay. I guess it's a public hearing, so, all right. James Feeney and then Kurt Norbeck. <coughs> I'm James Feeney from North Boulder. Um, a few things stood out to me uh, reading uh, through the ordinance. Um, there were some problems with the form of the ordinance, uh, a certain lack of professionalism. Uh, it fails to highlight the revisions in the ordinance when I read through it. Uh, ordinances used to be written that way, so you could just see where the changes were being made. Um, there was nothing like that in here. There's also a PDF file made available on the city's website that uh, had some non-standard PDF format. Uh, that didn't allow cut and paste. Um, that was kind of annoying. Um, so I don't know whether anybody was able to do a side by side with the old and the new, um, but uh, it was kind of a problem. Uh, I want to echo uh, Mary's uh, raising the point about um, snow removal on uh, uh, bus stops. Uh, I don't think that you should just let that pass. Uh, I'd insist that some explicit wording be uh, incorporated into the standard, because otherwise it's just not going to happen. Um, three things uh, that stood out uh, for me, uh, construction standards 2.04H, uh, speed lane changes. Um, the enabling language didn't clarify to me uh, whether uh, the change in the language was going to uh, allow the removal of speed uh, change lanes uh, or the um, addition of speed lane changes. And uh, the most terrifying example I can think of uh, is the intersection at uh, Valmont and Foothills. Uh, you have this four-lane highway, uh, and there's no acceleration lane. So uh, entering traffic uh, may be surprised to encounter oncoming traffic in what otherwise might be expected to be an exclusive acceleration lane. What could possibly go wrong? So um, I hope uh, that the, um, the standard change uh, requires uh, speed lane changes as opposed to allowing uh, the director to uh, eliminate those speed lane changes, and I'd like to find out what actually happened there. I don't know what happened there. 
Um, the second thing, uh, uh, 212B4, uh, street level <coughs> design, um, uh, the language there is poles shall be located uh, so that the center of the pole is three feet behind the face of the curb. So you have this four or five foot uh, sidewalk um, and conceivably we're going to put the uh, light pole three feet into the middle of the sidewalk. Uh, that sounded like crazy talk to me um, because obviously it's not a good thing to stick the lamp post in the middle of the sidewalk. Uh, the standard wording could be changed to simply allow that uh, um, the lamp has to be not in the middle of the sidewalk. So uh, I think now is a better time to um, address that wording. Um, uh, DCS uh, chapter 11, uh, the curb ramps. Um, so uh, there's a standing joke in engineering that says that uh, the nice thing about standards is that uh, there are uh, so many to choose from. Uh, the obvious uh, implication here is that uh, having a lot of standards is equivalent to having no standards at all. Uh, this is a bad idea. I counted 12 different uh, street costing designs in the drawing. Uh, really? Seriously? Uh, I Thank think you, maybe James. you want to lower the number there. Kurt Norbeck. Hi, Kurt Norbeck speaking first on behalf of Community Cycles. Uh, we thank planning and transportation staff for their work on updating the DCS. It has been a pleasure to collaborate with them so far, and we look forward to a continuing productive discussion on subsequent revisions. We support the proposed modest changes. We also strongly support the comments by both TAB and Planning Board. In particular, we would suggest that Planning Board's proposals for increasing the residential sidewalk width standard from four feet to five feet and adding consideration of pedestrian safety, utility, multimodal use, and walkability to the criteria for alternative design to be sufficiently minor changes to justify their inclusion in the current phase one ordinance. We also greatly appreciate uh, Planning Board's endorsement of 20 is plenty. However, we want to clarify that speed limits and design speed or target speed are different but complementary. Speed limits are what show up on the signs, but it's important to reinforce those limits through street design that encourages safe traffic speeds and makes all users feel more welcome. To help reinforce the 20 is plenty campaign, we strongly support reductions to the street design speeds specified in the DCS. In phase two, we also hope to see consideration of changes to intersection design, such as corner radii and slip lanes, sidewalk reconstruction standards, and traffic study requirements, among others, all based firmly on the TMP goals, Vision Zero, and our climate action goals. We urge council to support staff in prioritizing these phase two efforts. Thank you. I want to add something quickly just from myself that I thought of uh, in listening to the discussion about uh, the GARE resolution. Um, so this is, again, just coming straight from me. Uh, people of color, undocumented persons, and the disabled, among others, are less likely than people of privilege to have access to cars and are more likely to depend on transit, walking, or biking to get around. They therefore have historically been and con continue to be treated inequitably by our motor vehicle-centric transportation design. It's time to begin to rectify that. Updating the DCS is an important step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Okay, bring it back to council for consideration. You want to kick us off? So. Okay, um, <clears throat> go for it. Okay. Um, I move to adopt Ordinance 8370, updating transportation design standards by amending the City of Boulder Design and Construction Standards, DCS, originally adopted pursuant to Ordinance 5986 and setting forth related details. Consideration of this ordinance is phase one of updates to the transportation design standards of the City of Boulder. And I wanted to add um, to Section 2.13 um, something to the effect of um, where it says new transit stops and enhancements to existing transit stops shall be designed in accordance with RTD's bus infrastructure standard drawings with consideration of NACTO's transit street designed and 
where space permits include um, consideration of snow storage or something to that effect. I'll second it. Great. So um, thank you, staff, for making these changes. And uh, the meaty stuff, I guess, is going to be in phase two. And um, I look forward to that. Uh, I also appreciate breaking it into two phases and getting these important ADA and other changes made so that we can move forward with all new construction having those safety features and then also bringing forward the speed issue in the next phase. I think there'll be a lot to that. I agree with all of that. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, Bill and the staff for the answers to my questions that I posted yesterday. I appreciate that. And so I look forward to the, the phase two doing a, a deeper dive um, on some of those, um, those issues about pedestrian safety and implementation of our transportation master plan goals. Um, and as well as the 20s Plenty initiative that we'll be undertaking in 2020. Um, I, I did just want, I had one kind of remnant question. Um, so I don't know, Bill, if this is for you, you answered my earlier question, but um, it's about that, um, the criteria for alternative street designs. And so the, the what I thought was interesting, so the, the current language says that streets shall be designed with due attention to building spacing and setbacks, green spaces, attractive materials, plantings, and landscaping. And then it also says that if the pavement and right-of-way lifts are, are less, then you should get improved safety out of it. But it doesn't mention safety in the alternative, in the street design itself. And so I thought you made a, a good point that, that plan board's recommended language calls out a certain subset of goals, but maybe they're not the right ones or something like that. But, but it, it does strike me that, that the language for street design doesn't mention, mentions a number of things, but not safety. Right. So it, what, what's your thought on that? <coughs> Bill Cowan, uh, Principal Traffic Engineer and Interim Transportation Director. Um, so you're correct. The, I think one concern we had is that um, we would question the value of putting only a subset of goals into an ordinance. Um, rather, it would be better to simply reference something like the transportation master plan or, or something of that nature that, um, such that it would then change whenever that document changed. Um, certainly, um, safety is a, a primary consideration in roadway design. Um, and again, it would be, I think, a reasonable expectation of the community and policymakers that the director, whenever they are making decisions about alternative roadway design, is considering the transportation uh, master plan goals um, and safety would be paramount in there. Okay, so, yeah, that, and that makes sense. What, what, what would you think about, um, since it does list a number of things, you know, adding to the end something like, uh, it, as well as the overall goals of the transportation master plan. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's probably reasonable. I think I would I would keep our recommendation the same. I'd prefer not to edit an ordinance on the fly, right? I would prefer to um, make any any wording um, changes in a very deliberative process, and so I would rather that we do that in phase two, and and determine exactly what it should say. But I think that if you were determined to do it, then language like that would probably be better than um, what planning board had suggested. Okay, well, I, I guess in the future, I reserve the right to make edits on the fly, but I know phase two is coming right up, yep. so I can, I can wait. Okay, thank you. Other thoughts, comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second, show of hands. You're amending, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. We're as amended. As amended. Yep. As amended. Yep. By Mary. Mm -hmm. I didn't make an amendment. Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. <clears throat> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we didn't, we have no matters from the city manager, no matters from the city attorney. We did not do a call up for either 8A or 8B. So we're on to 8C, I think. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Committee assignments. <clears throat> so 
I think that we have settled most things and Junie has a few additions. So would you like to tell us about those? Yes, thank you. Um, I did send an email to council last week about being added to the county consortium of cities. And I'm not so sure if, I guess since Mark Wallach is in it, I wanted to know for the Colorado Municipal League, does it have to be staff? as an alternate? No? So can I please be added to that? The CML? Yes. Okay, so I think Mark, so do you not want to talk about Consortium of Cities? I did, but since Mark is already, Mark, did you sign up for that or yeah. would you just assign? Yeah, um, so he wasn't did. wasn't imposed upon me, I, I did sign Okay, up. so can I be added to the CML instead? So for CML, yeah. um, yes, I think you can. Um, we have two votes on the Colorado <laughs> Municipal League okay. because we're above 100,000 people. Yeah. And Carl will probably still come, Carl Castillo will okay. probably still come with us. So okay. I think that would be fine. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, too bad he's not here. I would ask him what his thoughts are. No. Just recall that that meets three times a year. And yes. it's long meetings. That's so perfect. Ten till three. That's perfect. So um, I, I can comment on that, and that's how it was set up. Mm -hmm. It was Suzanne and myself, and um, Carl would go. Okay. He's perfect. a staffer. You yeah. get lunch. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and and oh, it's focused yeah. really on the Colorado legislative agenda. That's even better. Okay. Thanks. And also, I would like to be added to the financial strategy study committee. Okay and also the Alpine Balsam County Participation Subcommittee. So I would make one comment about that, and that's to have Bob give a briefing on where we think that's going. Okay. Yeah, I think Mark, Mark and I were at the last meeting. I think we're only gonna have one more meeting. Um, so um, it may not be a real satisfying assignment. <laughs> that's, that's still fine. I still want to be part of it. Okay. Thank you. I, mean, I, I, I think it's, sure. I think it's fine. The, the purpose of the last meeting is really a, a preparing a joint communique and what has been, I think, agreed by the participants, but if you'd like to participate in that, it's on uh, January 7th. That's perfect. Yep, <laughs> that may very well be the last meeting of that group. Mm -hmm. And I have a question about the um, financial strategy subcommittee. Do you need, um, was it your desire to be added to the charter subcommittee um, or to be considered <coughs> Um, at the end of the charter when we decide what form we might move forward with. Yeah, I would like to be part of both processes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I think anyone else have any additions or changes from our last conversation? Okay, so did you get those? CML, Financial Strategy, and Alpine Balsam County Working Group, so, okay. If there's no other changes, um, would someone like to make a motion that we make these our city council committee assignments? So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All right, great. All in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. All right, and then homework items, right? Mm -hmm. Mary, do you want me to kick it off? Or do you want to start? the retreat why don't you start Bob okay it might be helpful to work backwards actually from the retreat and then we can work back into some things that we'll need to do before the retreat so you all received in your packet um, a proposed agenda uh, for the retreat which was put together <coughs> by Mary and I and Lynette and Jane and um, Taylor and <coughs> other people that participated so this would be a good time to speak up if you um, like to do something different for our retreat just to recap the retreat and this is um this is for those of you who've been on council for years that uh, this is pretty similar to what we've done in the past we have found that it works we are facilitated by heather bergman who does a outstanding job of getting us through all of this um and we typically kick off at four o'clock on a friday afternoon with a bit of an icebreaker and the emergenetics profile which we'll talk about in a second <laughs> And then we spend the rest of the evening on a Friday evening talking about council procedures. And this is our opportunity to suggest to one another um, changes in our procedures. I know we've heard a few of them already and, and um, we'll have an opportunity to express more 
uh, well before we arrive that day. Um, we have a working dinner, and the, the idea is to, to get out of there uh, no later than 9 o'clock with some idea of, of some changes in procedures. Then the next day, we really are developing our work plan for, well, really it's a two-year work plan, focusing on 2020, but also looking into 2021. And we talk about our priorities first, and again, we will have expressed those ahead of time. We'll talk about that in a second. And then it's a bit of a negotiation with staff about um, what we think we can get done. In, uh, in the time frame, and staff will have sized for us. They'll, they'll take the recommendations or requests that we make in advance of the retreat. They will have sized for us, small, kind of small, medium, and large. So we have an idea of how many smalls and how many larges and how many mediums we can we can put into a 2020 work plan. With the objective of obviously not filling up our entire schedule because things invariably come up during the year that we don't expect. Uh, and then uh, the goal is to get out of there by about four o'clock with a work plan more or less um, in hand. Typically what happens is a few weeks later, I think three or four weeks later, staff will refine that and bring that back to us for final approval. But the idea is at least to have a kind of a rough draft of a, of a work plan. Anything else, Jane or, or Mary, on the, on the retreat agenda? So folks comfortable with that? Yeah. Mayor Bay. Do we have to redo our Emmer, what are the Emmer genetics, or can we keep it? No, you head? don't. So that's a great segue, thanks. Because you did it before, right? Yeah. 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 So that's a great segue into the homework. So in order to get... I, I had something, actually, as well. Oh, yeah. As well. Go ahead. So th the schedule is clearly designed by morning people. <laughs> uh, so uh, as by starting at 8 and ending at 4, personally, I'd started at 10. But I w was wondering if folks would be willing to move it back just a half an hour and do 8.30 to 4.30. Apologies, uh, I have to leave for a wedding probably two hours early and then I'm in. I wouldn't go to it otherwise, but that's my only pushback. Sorry, Aaron. All right, no worries. I'll, I'll get up early for the team. Aaron, you were brilliant. You were brilliant at 7.30 this morning. Oh uh, yeah, my, my eyebrows, my eyelids did make it all the way up. <laughs> and you're still up. I'm you're still up. up. This has been a long day for all of us. Uh, to me, this looks good. I, <clears throat> I mean, if you're having to leave early anyway, that's kind of problematic because we will not be done with the work plan discussion yet. So um, you have to make sure that you have a list and you leave us with anything that we don't get to. Okay. Is, is it actually you getting married, Adam? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just wondering if congratulations were in order. No. So I think we this We were looks definitely good. not invited. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just take one pass down. So um, in order to, to have a successful day and a half, we need to do a little work ahead of time. So what I just passed out is something that Mary and I worked on this afternoon to kind of frame up the homework. Um, and so um, Mirabai mentioned the Emergenetics profile. The, a new council member should have received a link from Lynette on, on that profile. It takes about, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes to answer those questions. And I hope you've done it. And if you haven't, if you could do it by the end of this week. Um, it's kind of, if you've never been through it, it's kind of a Myers-Briggs that kind of talks about how you receive information and process information and and communicate and a whole lot of things about your personality. Those of us who've already done it, they're just going to bring that back so you don't have to do it again. The assumption is we don't change too dramatically from year to year. But I'm going to do it again Are to you? see if to six, years, <laughs> six years of counsel has yeah. traumatized my personality. <laughs> You'll answer much more carefully. <laughs> <laughs> then moving forward to um, right after the break, or as we're coming back from the break, um, what we're asking you to do is provide Lynette with two things, well, three things actually. Um, a, your list of your 2020 work plan requests. Um, these are the things that you liked us to tackle in 2020. Um, and uh, some of you have already started to submit this. As a matter of fact, we reviewed, for the veteran council members, we actually reviewed some of our lists from, uh, I think, on October 29th. So if you've already submitted those and you don't want to resubmit them again, we'll, we can recapture those. Um, but this is your list of, of items. And it, it would be real helpful if you kind of prioritize them. If you said this is, if we only did one thing this year, what would we do? And if we got two things done, what would we do? So if you could rank order them one, two, three, four, five, so we know what you really, really care about. And it's un and undoubtedly going to be true that there's going to be some things that are going to be on many of our lists, which is great. And that's how we determine that this is a really important item. Similarly with council procedures, I don't think you need to number these, but any ideas you have on ways to um, 
improve the way we operate or we engage with the community. I think Aaron's got a bold proposal out there that we shift meetings to a different night of the week. So anything that relates to length of the meetings or how meetings were operated or the role of the mayor and, and distribution of responsibilities, anything about process, um, uh, put in that note to um, Lynette and she will um, uh, kind of consolidate them and find areas of overlap and, and, and we'll be prepared to discuss those later that week. The second thing is you'll be receiving soon, when Lynette? I should have all of them by Friday. By Friday, we'll have, uh, we've asked all the boards and commissions to um, deliver to us a letter listing their priorities because that's gonna help us frame our priorities. And uh, we will each be assigned two or three, probably two, um, boards and commissions, kind of randomly. Um, and so while it's always great if council members could read all of the boards letters, which we will receive, in particular focus on the two that you've been assigned randomly, and um, prepare just a short little bullet point summary of what you um, perceive that board is asking us to do for 2020, and get that into Lynette by January 6th. You can get it in earlier if you want. And what Lynette will do is we'll, again, uh, kind of amalgamate all of these things and turn it on one master presentation. So taking that information on the 6th, um, uh, the, the next day we have a regular council meeting on January 7th and we've set aside t a time in that meeting. And this is really not for us to advocate for our, our work plan priorities. That, that will happen at the retreat, but this is an opportunity for staff to ask us questions. And we've only allocated, I think, about 30 minutes for this. So this is just, this is really them asking us, so Aaron, you asked for such and such, what are you really hoping to accomplish with that? Or what's, what does this mean? Or what's the, um, the uh, output you want us to get from them. And if, if, it, if we're all very, very clear, clear, that may be a very short discussion. Because between the, our meeting on the 7th and our special meeting that week on Thursday the 9th, um, staff will then kind of size these things. You know, some of these projects, one thing I've observed in my four years on council is to council members, everything is a no-brainer. Everything is really small and we can just do it really, really quickly. And, and, then, and, and, then, and then staff <laughs> interjects reality and points out to us that we have lots of community engagement to do and there's lots of drafting to do and we have lots of research to do. So they'll endeavor to, in that two-day uh, time frame, size these things so, we, so that when we get to the retreat, we know how many smalls and how many mediums and how many larges we have so we don't overload the schedule. The other thing we'll do that night on the 9th that our special <clears throat> study session is we will then present those two boards and commission letters each that each of us. So we'll, we'll put together our little bullets for the PowerPoint and Lynette will create a master PowerPoint and then we'll just probably go down the line and, and present to each other and to the community what we're hearing from the boards and commissions. And then finally, um, a woman by the name of Heidi who is our specialist in emergenetics will um, help us interpret and understand the profiles that we have uh, uh, um, and then what we're gonna ask folks to do is between then and the time we actually have a retreat is we're gonna randomly pair up council members and because there's nine of us, um, one of us will be fortunate enough to be paired with Jane. And so those five pairs are um, asked to go off and have a cup of coffee or whatnot and, and kind of compare each other's profiles. And what the idea is one of the things we'll do at the icebreaker at that, um, that evening session at the retreat is we'll introduce each other. And we'll maybe talk a little bit about each other's profiles. Um, you can, of course, um, when we'll have those assignments, Lynette, when will you? On Thursday. On Thursday. Session. It, okay. Could you assign um, uh, us, because it's just assignments, a little earlier, that way if people want to put things on the calendars, yep. um, we won't have our emergenetics or our, prof our uh, analysis of those until the 9th, but if people know who their partner's on and, and want to put some things on the calendars, maybe they can do that ahead of time. I'll do that right away. Is there, um, we might want to check in with <coughs> Heather, um, just to make sure that that doesn't mess anything up. I don't think it will, but um, but the the concern was that if we don't um, assign that sooner, it's kind of hard to set up times to meet. So yeah, we that'll just be wanna, fine. Yeah. Okay. Great. And Heather actually will be walking us through the study session on the ninth. So th those of you who haven't met Heather yet, you'll have an opportunity to spend some time with her before the retreat. Anything else, Mary, that we're missing? That's it. I think you covered it. You guys have any questions? For those of you who've been on council, this is relatively similar to what we've done the last few years. It's, it seems seems to work if you guys got... Well, advice. don't forget that mid-year we had That's right. a baby retreat. That's right. And so one of the things I think we'll talk about on, on when we get to process is whether we should have a mini retreat maybe in July to check in to see how we're doing. Um, 
No, I was talking about the one in January. Oh, yeah, last year, this year, yeah. yeah. We only had a baby retreat this year. Yeah. Yeah. Where it was just the Friday evening, it's not Friday Saturday. Evening. Yeah. So I think we tend to on the. On I think the, that's a good tradition. It is a good tradition. So when we have um, newly elected council members and we, we just launched this council, this tends to be a longer retreat. And then a year from now, we may have a shorter check in retreat. But we also may do a check in in July just to see how we're doing mid year. So, I mean, the only question I have is how you're thinking about handling the ongoing priorities. So, obviously, if there are things which staff expects to continue, I wouldn't expect us to necessarily be ranking them. Great segue. Okay, perfect. So, can we start with that? So, what CAC and the retreat committee asked staff to do um, so that you can prepare over the holidays to figure out what your priorities are, is that you asked us to talk about what our ongoing priorities are. So you don't need to list these on January 7th as things that you want to do unless you need more clarification on them. Um, remembering that this is a two-year work plan that, that we're thinking of. So if you've got priorities that you think are bigger or bolder and can't be done in a year, but they could be done in two years, those are f perfectly fine priorities to add on your January 6th um, item. The other thing is that on your uh, desk tonight, you have a book. And this book is the Council Action Guide. We prepare this every year, and it has information in there about s some of the top projects that staff is already working on. So as you start thinking about what your priorities are, please take a look at this to see if we're already working on it. There's also descriptions of de um, departments in there, so just lots of background information. So tonight, what we're going to do is go over a number of priorities that we have already established that we're already working on, and I have a staff member here that will discuss each one of them, and we'll go through the slides one at a time. So there's several items with regard to the climate commitment, several items with regard to the planning work that we're already doing, the South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Project, the Comprehensive Financial View, Vision Zero, and Racial Equity. So those are projects that we're already working on. So I'm gonna start by turning it over to Steve Katnack, our Director of Climate Initiatives, to talk about their two projects. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, I'm glad we recently had a conversation, so this I, particular topic I can make relatively short. Uh, as you know, the city is pursuing the development of a municipal electric utility, which has been an ongoing initiative with the city for uh, multiple years. Uh, we have, in the past year, had several milestones where we have uh, emerged from the PUC and have a clear path forward uh, towards municipalization. So as we move forward in 2020 and uh, towards a vote in 2021, we continue to work to refine the costs of standing up the utility, uh, the cost of acquiring those assets, uh, the cost of condemnation is, of course, a path towards that, our costs for separating the utility, and, of course, our commitment to a continued community engagement and really ensuring that we are being as transparent as possible uh, to the citizens in the community. Uh, so with that, if we could advance to the next slide. The a new initiative that uh, we brought before Council in July of this year is both the continued implementation of our climate commitment, but really the refinement through a climate mobilization action plan. And this is in recognition of the fact that we really need to establish a plan where equity, resilience are core filters that we're applying to multiple areas, par primarily our buildings, our electric system, our electric supply, and also our transportation systems, recognizing that also how we utilize our land and our buildings, and also how our financial systems are established are all key to creating this plan. Uh, we also are moving forward with this plan with the understanding uh, that because of the urgency of our climate uh, crisis, we, it's really critical that we start to address systemic change, that we're not only looking at initiatives that are going to affect 
uh, the community of Boulder, but how do we go about making those big changes uh, that affect a much broader area and those large systemic changes that are gonna make a real difference in what we're trying to accomplish. So I don't know, Jane, if you want anything more, but at this point. No, our plan was that we would Chris. go through each one of the items and then Chris Mestock is next with the items that they're working on through the planning department. Great. Chris. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Good evening, Council. Chris Meschuk, uh, Interim Planning Director, Assistant City Manager. So the Planning Department has three priorities that are continuing um, for the next two years. Uh, the first is related to the Community Benefits Project, as well as the Site Review Criteria Update. And so uh, Community Benefits, that is a project that um, we started last year. We finished the first phase, which was to establish a community benefits program in the land use code um, that says um, for those areas that are allowed to go from the base zoning height, which is typically around 35 to 38 feet, up to the charter maximum height of 55 feet, that extra height that you get the community needs to get a benefit in return. And so that's the concept of the program. The first community benefit that we established was for affordable housing. Um, the program always intended that there would be a suite of community benefits that an applicant could choose from. So this second phase is to continue that suite of um, potential community benefits that someone could provide. And so that's the work that we're gonna, we're gonna do. Um, and that includes everything from affordable um, commercial space to maybe space for nonprofit or the arts or for um, human service organizations. So those are the sorts of things that we're gonna continue to explore through this. We'll also be looking at the site review criteria. Um, the site review criteria are for um, larger developments that go through that discretionary review process. There is a very long list of criteria that they have to meet um, and there is some cleanup to that uh, criteria that is necessary and so this project because it will already be working on the site review criteria, um, we wanna clean that up as well. And so that's what this one uh, is about. The next one is the East Boulder Subcommunity Plan. So on last year, we kicked off um, kind of a renewed effort to do subcommunity planning. We have 10 subcommunities in Boulder. The North Boulder subcommunity um, is the only other subcommunity that has a plan. So we are um, finished, we have finished the first two phases of this project. Um, there's a community working group that is working uh, uh, to um, guide this project. Um, and the intention is that through 2020, we will complete the, the East Boulder subcommunity plan. And then the very last one that we have uh, is related to use tables and standards. So this is the second phase of this project. Um, we did the first phase. The use tables are in the land use code and it is basically a very long list of all of the things that you might be able to use a piece of land for and which zoning districts they're allowed or not allowed or they're allowed if you meet certain criteria. And um, for many of those categories, we had not updated them in decades. Um, and so we have things like data processing facilities um, that isn't really how you, you process data these days. So things like that that we need to update. The first phase, we focused on the zoning districts that were located in the geographic area of the Opportunity Zone to address any concerns there. Um, and this next phase will complete all of the other zoning districts. We have 42 zoning districts in the city um, to go through and review all of the different um, uh, uses and whether there's any changes the idea of this project is really to help bring it into conformance with um, the visions that are articulated in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, especially around things like 15 minute neighborhoods. So we anticipate that that'll be a high part of the conversation. So, so. Chris, just to <clears throat> level set on this one a bit, we did 18 zoning districts in the Opportunity Zone, is that I right? I believe so, off the top of my head. We had done BC1 and BC2, so we're something like halfway through the work of the Correct. staples. All right. Yep. Um, this is, uh, maybe you didn't put this up here because this is not really a continuation from this the last council, but we talked um, a week or so ago about the comp plan midterm. That's also on our work plan. Yep. Right, okay, so. Yep, it's still on the work plan. These are just the continuing ones. That's, that's a new initiative that we're starting. Got it, okay, great. Yeah. Great, so with that, I think I turn it over to Joe Tadeucci in Public Works Utilities. Great. 
So good evening, I'm Joe Tadeucci, Utilities Director in our Public Works Department. Um, so on November 19th, we had a process check-in with you where we talked about the South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Project and the CU South um, annexation. And just quickly, the, the flood mitigation, when South Boulder Creek floods, it overflows its banks and um, creates a new flow path down the West Valley and floods neighborhoods um, in South Boulder. And so the flood mitigation project is aimed at creating flood detention and storage to protect those neighborhoods. Um, in order to construct the project, we need approval from three different property owners, which includes the University of Colorado, their city property that's managed by our open space and uh, mountain parks department, and then um, some work with CDOT. And in order for the annexation of CU's property to move forward, that's part of this, the flood mitigation project really needs to be defined of what the footprint is and what the inundation areas are. And so for this year, um, we are actively working towards a February study session where we'll be checking in with you on the engineering work that we've been doing and um, really bringing in a comparison of what's been uh, termed the variant one concept and looking at different flood protection levels, the 100 year, the 500 year and in between and giving you um, information about what some of the trade-offs would be with all of those things. And so following the study session, we'll have uh, public engagement, give the boards an opportunity to weigh in and then come back to council, hopefully in May, to get direction and kind of final definition of what the project is so that we can move forward with um, preliminary design and permitting and kind of the heavy lifting of the annexation process. Okay. And Kara uh, Skinner, who is our Deputy Director of Finance, is gonna talk about our long-term financial strategy project. Thank you, good evening, Council. Uh, we did discuss this project just last week, so it should be quite familiar. Uh, it is anticipated to be a two-year project, and again, focused on a more holistic, long-term approach to financial planning uh, that also applies a racial equity lens. Um, the outcomes of the goal we dis or the outcomes or goals that we discussed last week are listed here on the slide. Um, the first work that we will get to work on uh, early January is the Financial Strategy Study Committee will focus on the library district analysis, researching ongoing finance subcommittee structures, refining the forecast, funding models for discussions related uh, or that could inform our 2020 ballot issues discussion in May, and then also researching racial equity lens tools. So that's the sort of phase one of the project, but we do anticipate it will be about a two-year project. Thanks, Kara. And then I think Bill Cowron, you're next with Vision Zero. Good evening, Council. Um, Vision Zero is uh, a summation of our travel safety goals. Um, our primary goal, primary Vision Zero goal being the elimination of severe crashes in the city of Boulder, uh, serious injury or fatal crashes. Um, Vision Zero is something that permeates um, all aspects of transportation. We include it in the way that we uh, design, plan and design our facilities, where we operate and maintain them, and the way that we educate the community around legal expectations um, and, and generally safe behavior. There is uh, many ways in which this can come before City Council, um, but two areas in which it will come before City Council for sure is um, the discussion of residential speed limits and the update the phase two update of the design and construction standards. And you may recall that we mentioned this this morning a little bit when we talked to our legislative um, committee about what we're working on. And then the last item is Amy Kane gonna talk about racial equity. Um, yeah, Amy. So thank you again for having me back. Um, so 2020 priorities, which we already discussed was the community engagement um, and the adoption of the racial equity plan. The bias and microaggression training that we'll be rolling out for all city staff, councils, boards, and yourselves. 
Um, and then also one thing we did not talk about earlier this evening was the implementation of the police oversight. Um, the Police Oversight Implementation Committee, most of the members of the Police Oversight Task Force have decided to continue on with the work, and we will be starting the implementation phase January 9th. So we will be providing updates to council as the process goes throughout, um, and we'll just keep everybody informed along the way and hopefully have another um, res or, uh, ordinance up for adoption sometime towards the end of the year. So thank you very much. So, uh, yeah. Something about Amy. Thanks for um, talking about the citizen oversight yes. um, task force. I just wonder, in, in when we're presenting things to the community about our work plan, if that mm -hmm. might get a separate bullet point, or if it's maybe a subheading or something like that, because um, it is a very concrete step, and people might not realize that racial equity includes the formation of the citizen oversight task force. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks. That's a good a good suggestion and a reminder. So um, just, we're happy to answer any questions, but I did want to talk a little bit about the book that you have in front of you, because it could be very helpful. At the very beginning of it, you should have um, this PowerPoint, followed by a table of contents. And you'll see that the first thing in there is our 2019 accomplishments. So you can take a look at one of the, many of the things that we accomplished. It's been divided into different areas, and th these areas are part of our sustainability framework, which is how we look at all the operational work that we do in the city. So environmentally sustainable, accessible, and connected, et cetera. And it's how we think about our budget every year as well. So this will give you an idea of the kinds of things that we can accomplish in a given year. It's followed by the project summaries, and those project summaries are in more detail of the items that you've heard tonight. So these are the ongoing projects. And then the next part of it is overviews of each one of the departments and the work plans that those departments are always already working on. So you might take a quick look at those, particularly if you've got a, a thing that you wanna do and you think it, it falls in a particular department, you might take a quick look at their work plan already to see if maybe it's already on there. Um, might not be, but it, it might be as well. Um, and of course, all the work that we do goes to the core services of our community, because um, when people wake up in the morning, they just want to get to work and get their kids to school, and that's what we do. So any questions about what's been presented tonight or um, your assignment, any way we can help you get ready for the retreat? Jane, is um, this document available um, electronically? It, excuse me? Is this about, did we receive this electronically? It, electronically, are, are we, yes, we are receiving it electronically. You can re receive yeah, it electronically and it's on the website. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Bob? I just wanna make an observation which maybe some of the veterans will agree with or disagree with. It seems like, um, it's not a bad thing or, or a good thing, it's just a fact. It seems like we have a lot of carryover this time, more than I can remember in my four years. And, which is fine because we broke a lot of things into phases and you saw a lot of phase twos up there. So I just, I guess I'm making that observation to um, um, suggest that as we come up with more things to do over the next two years, we just want to be mindful of the fact that we've already got a lot of work on our plates already, right? I mean, we've got, you know, uh, months of work right here. I totally to, appreciate that comment. Not, not, oh, thank you so much. Not to discourage anybody from throwing <laughs> new ideas on the table, I just want us to, recognize that we, we've already kind of got a fair amount of work already. And I guess the other, oh, sorry, go ahead. Aaron. Yeah, I appreciate that, Bob, very true. Although it is the council's prerogative to take things off as well. So yes. if the majority of council said, you know what, one of those things, not the most important thing anymore. We certainly can decide that. We got a lot of new people who might have mm -hmm. other ideas. Mary? No, and I was just gonna add that um, we also want to end our meetings by 10.30. Or earlier. And yeah. and yeah, and adding stuff is mm -hmm. more time. So. Yeah, another reminder is that there will be things which come up <clears throat> that we don't plan on, whether it's an assault weapons ban or some other uh, out of the blue kind of deal that the community really wants us to, to take up right away. So leaving a little slack in the work plan has advantages when those surprises arise. Rachel? So for what's currently on our agenda, 
do we need to like rank those or, or do anything in advance or we're just, I guess, following up on Aaron's suggestion, like are we ignoring those? I don't think you need to rank those. The, those are already underway. I, I think the only way or only time that you would be kind of ranking them is if something really important came up at the retreat that everybody said, oh yeah, we wanna do it. And then staff said, yeah, but we can't unless you take off something. And at that point, you'd be looking at the other things and going, oh, well, maybe you know East Boulder sub-community wasn't as important as we thought it was. But, I, and I just picked that as an example. I'm not suggesting it in any way. So that, otherwise we're doing this stuff and onward. Yeah. And some of it really is integrated on work plans right now and is kind of rolling along like Vision Zero that all came out of the TMP. And so that's not, it's work that they're doing, but it's not like a new project or anything. Um, the phase twos, I will point out, they are particularly the use tables and the site plan review criteria, they are as unsexy as you can possibly imagine. They're planning wonkery, but they're stuff that has built up 20 years of accreted badness. And when people, when developers talk about wanting to, to streamline things, that's the work you have to do. It's like revising use tables from the 1990s isn't gonna get anyone really excited, but it is gonna get us towards our goals on land use. And so that's just something to know is that some of these, if we get them done, they won't get touched for 20 years likely. So it, it does get some of us excited. So. <laughs> <laughs> just not very many wait. people. <laughs> Maybe three of us up here. Um, anything else from anyone? Just one thing. I, I just wanted to um, just request that we get a link to the electronic version of this, please. Uh, yeah, um, can we do that tomorrow? That would be excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Any feedback on the meeting? Any debrief? Thanks for coming back, guys. Yep, thank you. And we're adjourned for 1030. <laughs> Happy holidays. <laughs> yep. Happy, Happy New Year. Happy holidays, everybody. Enjoy your time off. Live from Paris, on France 24.